So once more, thank you very much for the introduction and for the opportunity to give uh, this, uh, this talk. And uh, today I would like to discuss about renormalization in the framework of stochastic partial differential equations and how our experience uh, from quantum field theory can help us uh, understanding uh, or better understanding this kind of problem. This project is a joint collaboration with Nicola Drago from the University of Trento, Paolo Rinaldi from that of Pavia, and Lorenzo Zambotti from the Sorbonne University in Paris. And uh, this talk is based on a paper which is going to appear soon on communication in contemporary mathematics. The outline of the talk is uh, quite the standard one after a few motivations, uh, explaining in particular the role of renormalization in the framework of stochastic partial differential equations. I will try to convey you the message that our experience from quantum field theory can help us better understanding the role of renormalization in this framework. If time allows, and now I'm certain that time will not allow, I will discuss an example, namely the 5-4-D model, well, the stochastic 5-4-D model. So let's consider our prototypical problem. Uh, the prototypical problem uh, works as follows. Consider on Rn plus one, a Gaussian random variable centered at zero, and whose covariance is nothing but the delta distributions, uh, both in the spatial and the time direction. In addition, consider a random distribution u, whose dynamics is ruled by the following nonlinear stochastic partial differential equation, where you can recognize a linear part, which is nothing but the heat operator, a nonlinearity polynomial type with a coupling constant lambda, and the white noise appears as an additive white noise, therefore as a source term. So how do we solve this kind of uh, stochastic partial differential equations? So one can use uh, different frameworks uh, ranging from the theory of regularity structures uh, as proposed by Martin Eyring, but also the approach from Massimiliano Gubinelli. So our uh, control calculus uh, are perfectly suitable, especially if one wants to address the question whether a solution exists uh, and whether it is unique. In all these frameworks, renormalization plays a distinguished role, and it is always dealt with by means of an epsilon regularization to, let's say, smoothen out uh, certain distributions. And only at the end of the day, this epsilon regularization is removed by taking a weak limit. And this operation is, uh, from the viewpoint of quantum field theory, an operation we can avoid, and we can discuss renormalization in general. But uh, the question is why renormalization enters the game in this, uh, in this approach, which is far from the standard quantum field theoretical framework. Well, let us consider a simple case. Uh, so the, the cubic interaction, k equal three, and let us call G the fundamental solution of the heat operator. If we look for solution of the equation I've shown you before, we can try to look for a perturbative solution. Therefore, for a formal power series in lambda, whose zero to the term uh, leads to no problem because it's nothing but the convolution between the fundamental solution and the white noise. On uh, the contrary, already at first order, you can see where the problems arise, namely you have to take consider the convolution between still G and the zero order uh, taken to the power three. But this is a problem. Why? Because if we look at phi, which is the zero order, this is still a random distribution, so a random variable whose mean uh, is zero, so it's centered at zero, and whose covariance is given by the composition between uh, the fundamental solution and its adjoint. As far as uh, so far, the, well, as far as x is different from epsilon, there is no problem, it's perfectly well defined. But the moment that x tends to epsilon, which is necessary. For example, to define phi squared, we see that there is a pathological divergence which leads to an ill defined distribution. And therefore, already to define phi squared, you need to invoke renormalization. And if you go to higher powers of phi, then things are all, can only get worse. And that's the reason why you need renormalization. But if you look at this last formula and you try to forget for a moment that you're working in, let's say, a classical framework in the sense there is no quantum theory, but it's a stochastic partial differential equation, you can recognize that the kind of divergences you are seeing are structurally the same as those that we see in quantum field theory. Therefore, let's try to implement some of the techniques and frameworks we use in quantum field theory to deal with renormalization in this context. 
In particular, I would like to advocate using epstein glaser renormalization and the perturbative approach to algebraic quantity theory. The last, um, well, let's say PAQFT in particular is important and it relies on a specific notion, which is that of scaling degree, which is, let's say, a quantity which characterizes the divergence of a distribution and allow it to tell us whether certain distributions can be extended where they are not defined, be it a point or codimension one subject. Okay, if this is the framework, what are the ingredients? In general, and we can not consider the example I've shown you before, but we can work with the smooth Riemannian manifold M and down with the top density to make integrals, to define integrals. The linear part of your nonlinear SPD can be ruled by a micro elliptic operator, for instance, a second order elliptic uh, partial differential operator. Or, uh, an or let's say a heat type operator on our cross. In any case, it's important that both E, so your micro elliptic operator and its formal adjoint, they possess a parametric, so in some cases a fundamental solution, and we call them P and respectively P star. And with XI, we still uh, consider the standard Gaussian white. Now, from the algebraic viewpoint, since we want to discuss everything from the viewpoint of algebraic quantum theory, we need an algebra, and we need an algebra of functionals. In particular, we consider functional value distributions, which are nothing but maps from compactly supported function on the manifold M across the smooth function on M into the complex numbers, which are linear in the first entry and continuous in the topology of the M times EM. In addition, we require these functionals to be polynomial. And uh, furthermore, we require that the functional derivatives of these functionals do satisfy certain constraints at the level of weight concept. We don't, do not spell them in detail here because of the lack of time. But as an example, the weight concept of the first derivative of your functionals must be contained or coincides with the weight concept of the derivative. Canonical examples of functionals are of this type, so the integral of phi to the power k against the text function f with respect to the underlying top density mu. Now we need to endow this structure with an algebra, so well, this functional with an algebra structure, how can we do? First of all, we have to define the action of the parametrics, which is done as you can see here in the most natural way. And then we can construct an algebra as follows. Consider you know, what I will, I'll borrow the nomenclature of quantum field theory and call this uh, the, your field phi and the identity functional uh, one, which does not depend on the background configuration phi. And then first I defy a naught, which is an EM module, namely I consider linear combinations between phi and one where the coefficients are allowed to be smooth, uh, uh, so basically smooth real functions over M. Then I define A1 as the E modulus, uh, which comprises the union of A0 and the action of, of the parametrics P on the A0, and so on and so forth. In this way, I construct a filtration where A of order J1 is contained or coincide of A of order J2 if J1 is smaller or equal than J2. At the end of the day, I can consider a direct limit, which is this A. And this can be endowed with an algebra structure, which is basically here represented in formula, but it's nothing but the pointwise problem. So this is a very simple algebra, which does not contain any information at the moment from the stochastic world. The second tool I need, and I assume that in the audience, most of you are familiar with it, is that of scaling degree. If you're not familiar, suffice to say that the scaling degree of a distribution at a given point x naught is nothing but a number, which measure the degree of divergence of a distribution. Why is the scaling degree important? The scaling degree of a distribution is important for the following reason. The one can prove that, say, if you give me a distribution, which is everywhere defined except, say, at the point, but we can, you can generalize it at co-dimension one sub manifolds, but let's stick to a point x, then you compare the scaling degree of your distribution at that point x with the, the dimension of the underlying background, defining this row, which is called degree of divergence. And then the three scenarios can occur. The first one, if the degree of divergence is negative, then there exists a unique extension of your distribution to the whole manifold, which preserves the scaling. The second option is that the, the degree of divergence is finite, 
but positive are equal to zero. And in that case, uh, the extension still exists to preserve the scaling degree, but it's not unique. And two possible extensions uh, do differ by basically delta function or derivatives, depending on the degree of divergence. So, and uh, here there are some arbitrary coefficients, which are complex number in this case, so which do are. Last case is that rho is divergent. And in this case, well, there is nothing we can do. There is no extension for serving this. Now, this is the main slide because here I want to convey our main message. How do we encode in the algebra function also, which are polynomial functional with constraints on the way it comes set, which is the meaning of this subscript C, how do we encode information about the stochastic world? Now, we would like to tell our functionals that phi is not just a smooth configuration, but should be coming from the convolution between the parametrics and the white noise, and that this is a random process centered at zero, which covariance, whose covariance is ruled by this distribution Q, which is P composed with P star. How can we do that? Well, uh, borrowing, this, well, let's say doing as we would do in quantum field theory, we can encode the fact that there is a non-trivial non two-point function, uh, which is uh, basically encoded in this Q by deforming the algebra product to tell the algebra product that the two-point function is basically this Q itself. And then the second information is that we want to take an expectation value, which tells us that our a random process center at zero, and this is its covariance. And this can be done in a very simple way. Namely, you take your functionals, you deform the algebra product, and then you evaluate your functional at the configuration zero. This phi zero and this phi are completely different. In one is a stochastic variable and the other is our background configuration. But at the end of the day, these two steps basically yield or basically codify within your algebra the same information of the stochastic process ruled by the white noise itself. But also in this framework, there are divergences because the distribution Q is ill defined in the coinciding point limit. So it's defined outside the diagonal on M cross M. And therefore, in order to define it also on the diagonal, we need to normalize it. How do we deform the algebra? If you're not familiar with the deformation procedure, uh, let me show you an explicit formula, but for the, for the sake of being concrete, I need to take a one parameter family of smooth function on M cross M, weakly converging to the parametrics, and I can construct this two epsilon, which is now a smooth function on M cross M. Then let me take the algebra I defined at the beginning, and I can deform the product, obtaining still a unital commutative and associative algebra, whose product is here, is here represented. The tau and tau prime are still elements of the of A, but the product has been changed. And as you can observe, Q is entering the game already from K equal one, but at K equal zero, so the first term of your product is nothing but the undeformed point by Of course, if you want to take, to take into account renormalization and the, and the singularities, and the, the diagonal, you cannot use uh, this Q epsilon, but you need to get rid of the epsilon. But this is not done taking an epsilon, um, well, a weak limit, so sending epsilon to zero, but it can be done intrinsically using the notion of scaling. And our main result, is, well, one of the first main results we obtain is the point is that you can take a deformation that exists, a deformation of your algebra, which can be implemented with a formula similar, similar to the preceding one, which takes into account intrinsically the renormalization because Q is a renormalized quantity. It satisfies suitable constraints and its existence is guaranteed by the fact that the scaling degrees are fine. Of course, such deformation is non-unique. Why it's non-unique? Because if the scaling degree and the degree of the values are non-negative, all extensions are non-unique. And so there, there can be more than one, the, um, one deformation of your algebra encoding the information from the stochastic world, and we can classify how these different deformations are constructed and their Claudio. differences. Claudio, I, I think you, you need to conclude maybe in one minute or so. Try to yeah, yeah, just one slide. Okay, it's thank the, you. before the last. And let me, I, what I wanted to tell you is that there exists uh, basically a family of smooth functions uh, out of which you can compare the two deformations and therefore codify what is your renormalization.
There is no way to further constrain these, uh, these uh, functions because local covariance does not apply. So as promised, this is the last slide. Let me, con let me conclude by telling you that this is a new framework to analyze at a perturbative level stochastic partial differential equations. And our next step are to find a, con a deeper connection with the theory of regularity structures, but also to try to apply this kind of methods to hyperbolic stochastic partial differential equations, which is a framework where regularity structures are not working, as well as in the parabolic and elliptic world. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Are there any online questions? No. Okay, so uh, if not, let's thank Claudio for his nice talk. And, uh, and the second talk will be by Matthias Traube from Max Planck Institute, and he will tell us about, are you here? Yes. You will tell us about yep, cardi algebras, sewing constraints, and string nets. Go ahead, Matthias. So, first of all, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak here. And yeah, my talk is titled Cardi Algebras, Sewing Constraints. Ooh, this was wrong. Uh, sewing Constraints and String Nets, which is also the title of the paper I had uh, in September on the archive. And roughly speaking, it's a paper about yeah, mathematical uniqueness and existence proof of rational conformal field theory. And what is the basic setup? So the basic setup is consider you have a rational conformal field theory, which I call C here, and it's given on a genus G surface, and I allow this surface to have n boundary component, let's say. And the question you want to ask or what you want to get out of such a theory is always you want to get sensible correlators out of that, meaning that you want to have maps which take the n-fold tensor product of the Hilbert space of fields, and this map should map sort of the fields, these n input fields to the complex numbers, and furthermore, this should also depend on the surface, which I denote here by this little g, just to note that this depends on this genus g surface. So what does it mean to be sensible for such a correlator. So first of all, you should respect all local symmetries, which means sort of that you should satisfy the ward identities given by the symmetry algebra of your theory. And in conformal field theory, and especially in rational conformal field theory, there's sort of an elegant way to describe this. This is by saying that such a correlator should be an element in the vector space of conformal blocks uh, on that surface. And now, roughly speaking, what is this vector space of conformal blocks? These are all such maps such that the natural action of the vertex operator algebra on such a map is zero. And now you could compute this by choosing the local coordinates and punctures and doing stuff with the operator product expansion. And if you write that out, these are really what identities. Okay. And so this is sort of saying that these are local symmetries, but this of also global consistency requirements, if you wish. And I summarized them under the name sewing constraints. And this is first of all, if you have an element of the mapping class group of your surface, this correlator should be invariant under the action of the mapping class group. And secondly, if you have a correlator on this surface here and a correlator on that surface, so there's a natural notion of how to glue those correlators together. And what you should get out of that is you should get the correlator on the gluing surface. And similarly, you could have self gluings of surfaces, which should again evaluate to the correlator on the gluing surface. Now, here in this 
pictures. I only show close gluings, but you could imagine that you also have, sorry, um, open boundary components, and then you have open sewing constraints. Okay, this is the idea. So you, how you would describe such a rational conformal field theory via such sensible correlators. So the basic question is how to construct such sensible correlators. What input do I need and how to solve sort of for these correlators? And this is exactly what I did. So the input is a Cardi algebra, which is a rational conformal field theory in genus zero and one, if you wish, in some sort of sense. And then I use string net um, to construct such sensible correlators. Okay, so to make a bit more sense out of those words, we're going to tell you how to put sort of the heuristics here of those pictures into rigorous mathematics and make them really checkable. And this is a construction due to Fjellstadt, Fuchs, Funke, Schweigert. And you could do this sort of in the categorical world of rational conformal field theory by defining a category of open closed world sheets. And this category of open closed world sheets has as objects compact surfaces with open and closed boundary components. So here's such a parameterized circle in purple that's the closed boundary component, but you could also have parameterized intervals um, on boundary components, which are open boundaries. And morphisms in this category, they say um, pairs, and one part of such a pair is an open or closed sewing. So you could glue this surface along such a, such a circle, or you could glue it along such an interval. And the second part is an orientation preserving diffeomorphism of the sewing surface. So these morphisms really encode the consistency requirements from um, the sewing constraints. And then you could make the following definition. You could say, okay, conformal blocks are actually a symmetric monoidal functor from that category to the category of finite dimensional vector spaces. And now, of course, with this construction, you could not compute actually correlation functions because for actually computing correlation functions, you would need conformal blocks as a projectively flat vector bundle over the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. But this is supposed to be equivalent to a categorical modular functor. And this is one convenient way to describe this categorical framework, okay? So for me, this will be conformal blocks. And then you could make the following definition and say that a solution to the sewing constraints is mathematically given by a monoidal natural transformation from the trivial functor to this functor of conformal blocks. So the trivial functor assigns to any object just the complex numbers and to any morphism just the identity on C, then you see that those component maps of such a monoidal natural transformation, they actually are maps from C to a vector space of conformal blocks. So those are just vectors, correlators. And if you write out the usual commutative diagrams for natural transformation or monoidal natural transformation, you'll see that um, this exactly gives the sewing constraints for the, for the correlators, okay? So the task is to define such a functor and to solve or to, to define or solve, yeah, monoidal natural transformation. And how to do this? We do this via so-called string nets, which was firstly defined by Levin and Wen, but the description I give is due to Kirillo. And the description is as follows. So you need a categorical input first, which is for me always a modular tensor category. You don't have to be that general. String nets are usually defined for spherical fusion categories. But for me, it will be a modular tensor category because I want to think of the representation category um, of a rational vertex operator algebra. Okay, because recall the state space, the Hilbert space I had on the first slide, which had some representation or which is a representation of a rational vertex operator algebra. Okay, then a C colored string net is given by such a picture here. So I given here a string net on a genus one surface with three boundary components, and the string net is an isotopy class of an embedded finite graph. And this graph is colored as follows. So edges are colored by objects in, in C, and uh, vertices are colored by morphisms in C. Yeah. And then you could define a vector space, and this is the vector space of string nets. And this is given by 
formal finite C linear combinations of such string nets with boundary value A. So what is the boundary value? The boundary value is the color of the edges um, hitting the boundary. Sorry. And then you impose um, local relations. And by that, I mean that if you have an embedded disk here, for example, inside those embedded disks, the usual graphical calculus um, on the plane or the modular tensor category should hold. So in short, you could say C colored string nets are nothing else but a lift of the graphical calculus in this modular tensor category to all higher genus surfaces. And then it's a theorem by Kirillov that if you compute the string net space for a given boundary value, you actually compute um, the state space of the Dura Biro topological three dimensional topological field theory on that surface. Okay, so we're going to use those string nets. And now, what are Cardi algebras, the basic input of the construction? So, in one word or in one sentence, Cardi algebras. They describe consistent, open, closed, rational, conformal field theories in genus zero and one. And now they are open, closed. So you have to give uh, boundary conditions on the open boundaries. And now Cardi algebras have one single fixed boundary condition on all of those boundary components, okay? So what does this category mean? So this is a notion due to Huang and um, Kong, and it had its roots in really vertex operator algebras and intertwining operators and so on. But you could give a purely categorical description of that. And this description goes as follows. So for a modular tensor category C, a C slash set C Cardi algebra, where set C is the Drinfeld center of the modular tensor category, is given by a triple of data. And this triple of data consists of the following things. So first of all, H closed. This is an object in the Drinfeld center. And it's not just an object, but it's a Frobenius algebra in the Drinfeld center. So if you think of C as the representation category of a rational vertex operator algebra, this tells you that the closed state space is a representation of your symmetries and also that the operator product expansion um, gets encoded in this Frobenius algebra structure here in the Trinfeld center. Now, why should the Trinfeld center correspond to closed fields? This is roughly because the Trinfeld center is actually equivalent to the category tensor with uh, the reverse category, which you could think of describing as left and right movers. Okay. And the second input is that of an open um, state space, which is an element in C, and it's just not just an element, but it's a Frobenius algebra in C. And then the third thing, the third data is um, a map from the closed state space to the open state space, roughly speaking. Now L here, this is the adjoint functor to the natural forgetful functor from the Trinfeld center to the category C itself. And this map ensures that open and closed fields actually talk to each other. And of course, this data has to satisfy some consistency requirements, which are quite natural. So first of all, Yoda, this should be an algebra homomorphism. This tells you physically that so if you have two fields in the bulk and you let them interact in the bulk and then go to the boundary, this should give you, in fact, the same as first going to the boundary and then interacting as a boundary as boundary fields. Then, of course, on the closed thing in genus one, there should be a modularity condition. Third, there should be something which is called a center condition. And the center condition tells you that if you that you can move, so if you go from the bulk to the boundary, you can move this, this boundary insertion you had from the bulk through the bulk past another boundary. Um, components, so this should be some sort of interchanging rule, and of course there's a Cardi condition. And yeah, these are there are sort of analytic notions for that, but there is also a purely categorical notion for that. And now, okay, now I've told you sort of all the ingredients: string nets, Cardi algebras, and so on. 
So what I did with this is, is the following. So I've defined a functor of conformal blocks, which roughly speaking assigns to any object in this category of open closed world sheets, the string net space, where now the string net space has boundary values open, um, the open state space and the closed state space. And using this functor of conformal blocks and sort of string nets and the string net description of those consistency requirements of the Cardi algebra, I've shown that Cardi algebra colored string nets really uniquely determine a monoidal natural transformation and vice versa. So this is saying that every solution to the, to the suing constraints now for on, on an open closed, so for all open closed um, world sheets where you have only one fixed boundary condition are determined by the input in genus zero and one. And every input in genus zero and one, which is given by a Cardi algebra, can be uniquely extended to all higher genus surfaces using those string nets. Okay. This was everything I want to say. Thanks uh, for listening. Well, we start with questions from the audience. Is there any, any questions? Well, I, I have a very basic question. In your beginning assumptions, you decided to study rational conformal field theories. Is, uh, is this crucial? Could you generalize your work to irrational conformal field theories? Um, I think there is a path to that by the group of um, Schweigert in Hamburg. And the main obstacle you have to overcome is that the input here um, Bam, 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 bam. Let me see. We have string nets. So the input in the construction of string nets uh, from Kirillov, it needs a spherical fusion category. And to be fusion, you have to rational, you have to be a rational conformal field theory. But there is sort of a well-defined notion of dropping this, and I think people are working on that. So I'm comfortable that in the next few months there will be a generalization of this of this whole thing. Okay. Thank you. Any other question? I think you, you just click once. Once it's read, you can just, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I cannot hear the question. Let, I, I think I can repeat. How does this relate to the axioms of conformal field theory a la Konsevich and Siegel? Oh, how that, does this relate to the axioms? Hmm. So, uh, uh, I don't think that there's an easy answer to that uh, at all. So, the the only thing I could say is that those Cardi algebras, the definition I gave categorically, sort of they its roots in representations of an operat which is given by yeah, spheres with local holomorphic coordinates in some yeah, vector spaces. But I don't think that there's sort of an obvious root to that. I mean, for, for this Konsevich Siegel approach, you, you, you need uh, topological vector spaces and all of that, but this is sort of not, not the framework I'm using. So I, I, I don't have a good answer, let's say that. <laughs> okay, so if there are no further questions, let's thank Matthias again. Ah, the next speaker is on site, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Roberta Izzetti, and she will tell us about it's, it's, yeah, the BV construction and BRST cohomology in the framework of non-commutative geometry. Pointer. Is there a pointer here? It's coming. Ah, super. <laughs> it's 
so we can see. Can we see? Okay. Okay, so first of all, I really would like to thank the organizer of this thematic section for giving me the opportunity of speaking in front of you today, and of course to all of you for being still here. So in this uh, short presentation, I would like to um, tell you something about some recent result that I had about the BB construction, so this bottling wilco whiskey construction, and how this uh, uh, construction can be described in terms of uh, spectral triples. But before uh, going there, so I just want to tell you why and uh, considering non-commutative geometry. If I can change the slide. Does it look as working? Can it help? Is it? Oh, so it's only on my screen that is not changing, probably. Super, okay, then I will look uh, elsewhere. Okay, so as I said, so why non-commutative geometry? So uh, as all fields in uh, mathematics, uh, um, non-commutative geometry can be described from different perspectives. But uh, uh, my preferred one actually uh, looks at that as some kind of extension of classical differential geometry. So uh, the basic idea is that uh, uh, we are considering geometrical objects uh, and we want to translate them in algebraic terms. Because uh, doing this kind of translation, we actually manage to capture a bigger setting of uh, um, objects. So, so something that is, as I said, non-commutative or maybe discrete. So uh, trying to tracing back this idea, uh, we definitely have to uh, go back to the uh, gerfan neimar theorem that says as uh, there is an equivalence of categories between locally compact household spaces on one side and sister algebras, commutative sister algebra on the other side. So we could uh, roughly say that a key object in a classical topology can be described in algebraic terms as a sister algebra. Of course, a sister algebra is a rich object, so it doesn't have just an algebraic structure, but also a norm and a star operation. But uh, the key point here is that we are speaking about a commutative object. Natural question is, what happens if we drop the commutative uh, condition? So what we find is uh, some kind of, let's say, non-commutative topological space that, of course, uh, uh, is just an algebraic object. So we are losing completely uh, what is a geometrical intuition. So uh, Kant's uh, contribution uh, in this case appears when we try to enrich this construction considering a metric on the space. So in his uh, reconstruction theorems, uh, it says that there is uh, this equivalence of categories where on one side this time we have compact Riemannian spin manifold and on the other side uh, a canonical spectral triple. As you can see, that is not a, a triple actually, but they still, the first element is still actually a sister algebra, a commutative sister algebra that somehow encodes and accounts for the underlying topological space. Once again, we can uh, wonder what happens if we drop the commutativity condition and what we find is a spectral triple, which is a key object indeed in uh, non-commutative geometry. So to be precise, a spectral triple it, this time is really a triple. So it's given by an algebra, an involuntary unit algebra, faithfully represented over an Hilbert space, which is the second element of this triple. And the third is uh, a self-adjoint operator, which has to satisfy central conditions. So, but the key property of a spectral triple is that actually it encodes gauge theories. So given a spectral triple, we can construct a gauge theory following the recipe I uh, wrote over there. And uh, uh, in this case, actually for us, uh, gauge theory is just given by a field configuration space, which uh, uh, we denote with x0, an action functional uh, over the configuration space, and a gauge group. Of course, with the condition that uh, the action functional should be invariant on the orbits of the gauge group. Uh, the only thing where I want to draw your attention is how you construct the action functional. So the action functional is defined to be the spectral action of the spectral triple. So namely, is uh, going to be like the trace of, in this case, I wrote a polynomial, but in, let's say a well-behaving function of your operator. So um, then, of course, the natural question is, can we recover any interesting gauge theory in this setting? And of course, the answer is yes. So we actually can describe the full standard model in this kind of language. 
So, uh, namely, uh, you can actually um, see the standard model as uh, the gauge theory induced by a product where uh, the uh, M stands for a compact Riemannian spin manifold that accounts for the gravitational part of the, uh, the um, standard model and then uh, a finite part. So, uh, where finite actually is pointed out that the algebra in this spectral triple is a finite dimensional algebra. And this finite part is actually what describes the particle content. So this is really one of the main results in the field and is due to a series of people, so Kohn's, Shamsalin, Macaulay. So it's a really a key point that uh, emphasizes how indeed this, this strong relation between non-computative geometry and gauge theory. And this is why actually it makes sense to consider this framework for studying the BV formalism. So what's the context for this construction, for uh, the BV construction? So the context is the one of the quantization of gauge theory via the path integral approach. So if we try to apply the perturbative approach with a gauge theory, of course, we ended up having problems, problems related to the critical locus of the action functional that, of course, ended up to be not given by isolated points but by orbits, if we are considering, as I said, a gauge theory. Now, of course, the question is how can we solve this problem? So how can we get rid of this redundancy due to the presence of a gauge symmetry without, of course, changing the physics that we want to study? So a first uh, idea might be actually just let's take a quotient, but uh, um, you know often uh, the mathematical space that we get in this uh, occasion are not suitable for any proper analysis. So one can actually decide to take the completely orthogonal approach and add more objects. So namely adding what uh, they are called the ghost fields. So ghost fields are just some auxiliary particles characterized by a degree, uh, which is an integer and then by a parity that, described, that can be zero, so gives up bosonic real variable, or uh, can be one, so we are dealing with fermions, uh, Grassmannian variables. So uh, the key step in the BV construction is really this extension process. So on the first side, you do have your uh, initial gauge theory, and here I'm actually not taking a generic one, but really the kind of model that I'm interested in. So this uh, gauge theory is induced by finite spectral triples. If you do apply uh, this uh, BV extension, what you ended up having is something of this kind. So if you do start with a vector space as a configuration space, in uh, doing this extension, what you do is to add extra variables in um, every degree but in zero. So in degree zero, your um, z graded super vector space will just be your initial real uh, space with your initial uh, real physics fields and all the rest appears in degree different from zero. Of course, then there are other uh, property required for this uh, extended configuration space, and for what concern S tilde, this is going to be the extended action. So once again, it's given from the initial action plus extra terms, so that depends, of course, on the ghosts you have introduced. And of course, there is a condition uh, that you impose on this uh, extended action, so on this S tilde, and is uh, that it should be a solution of the classical master equation. So if you take the Poisson structure, uh, sorry, the Poisson bracket of uh, S tilde with itself, that should be zero. So this is, as I said, is the key step in the BV construction that, of course, uh, it's a, a big construction uh, with many people that contribute to that. Uh, but it's just the first step. So we can see the whole construction written over there, so I will not explain all the other bits. But what I want to emphasize is that each time you're given a BV extended theory, that naturally induces a cohomology group that is called this BV com complex. And what is interesting is that this complex, as well as the BRST complex, they do um, reconstruct, they do capture some of the physics of the, your initial theory. Now, um, so this BV formalism, based on this extension procedure, uh, so how can we put that in the framework of non-commutative geometry? So can we take advantage of uh, this strong relation existing between gauge theories and spectral triples to describe the BV uh, formalism in this context? So namely, imagine that you're starting with an initial spectral triple. Um, as I explained before, then what you can do is to actually construct a corresponding gauge theory, an induced gauge theory. Imagine that you do apply the BV construction to this gauge theory. Another question is, can we make uh, complete this diagram? So can we find a, another spectral triple that actually somehow lift the BV construction just to the level of spectral triples? So before answering this question, let's just make a few remarks. 
So, uh, of course, the spectral triples are defined having as an underlying uh, field at the complex numbers. So, while, I mean, actually our uh, bosonic fields are real, so we need to go from C to R. So, of course, we need at least to introduce a real structure. And then there is another characteristic that we have to remark, so that S tilde actually contains uh, Grassmannian fields. A result of that is that we, are not, uh, um, we cannot actually hope to encode S tilde in this new uh, BV spectral triple as we did for S0 in the initial one. So remember that S0 was coming as a spectral action of your spectral triple. In this case, what we have to use is another notion of action we do have in the world of spectral triple that is the one of spectral action. But of course, as you can imagine, actually, we can complete this diagram. So we can define a, a BV spectral triple that actually encodes our uh, BV extended uh, theory. So precisely, so here the theorem is set for U2, but just for <laughs> matter of space. So it can be more done more generally. And the idea is that if, if you're given an initial spectral triple, you can actually construct a corresponding BV spectral triple. Uh, so, of course, the characteristic of this BV spectral triple is that you can then define the corresponding X tilde and S tilde, so the corresponding extended theory. So, uh, we, what we can observe is that actually, uh, uh, if the initial gauge theory coming from your initial spectral triple was mostly related to the algebra and the Dirac operator in your initial spectral triple, in this case, uh, what plays a role is the Hilbert space. So, it's the Hilbert space that encodes the Gauss sector of your theory. Okay, for being sure that what we're doing is actually coherent, of course, we also need to take care of what happens for the BV complex. So, uh, as I told you before, so each time you have a, a BV extended theory, you can always define a BV complex. Uh, the same should naturally uh, happen also for our BV spectral triple. So, how we can actually do that? I mean, let's just look what are the cohomology theory you do find in non-commutative geometry. So here, what I wrote for you is this kind of, let's say, dictionary between non-commutative geometry and Riemannian differential geometry. In this kind of perspective, this is non-commutative geometry as some kind of, let's say, extended classical Riemannian geometry. So in this uh, dictionary, you see that, as I said, spectral triple are some kind of generalized manifold. And the two kind of uh, cohomology, the natural peers, are the Oshield and the cyclic cohomology. So here I just quickly recall what's the definition of the Oshield complex, where uh, the cohomology or the, the, the cochains are just given by um, homomorphism from the tensor product of the algebra with values in the bimodule M. And the cobandary operator actually um, has a part that depends on the left action of the bimodule, part on the right action, and of course, uh, part of the game is also played by the product structure on your algebra. So then com for completing the picture, the only thing that we have to do is to find the, the correct algebra with the correct uh, product structure in it, a correct bimodule, such that their Oshield complex coincide with our BV complex. And this is what happens. So uh, once again, this is for the U2 case. So the algebra is actually given by your Hilbert space, and the product structure comes from uh, the fermionic action of your spectral triple, actually in any degree but zero because actually zero appears and determines the uh, left and right action of your bimodule that actually is determined by the algebra. So schematically, this is how it works. So given your spectral triple, the way how you define the corresponding Oshield complex and precisely the algebra and the bimodule is in this way, where as I said, so the algebra um, in your BV spectral triple is actually somehow telling you about the bimodule. Uh, the um, algebra B is actually taking care of the Gauss sector, so it's related to your Hilbert space, while the fermionic action in degree zero gives you left and right um, action of the bimodule, and in any other degree is actually telling you something about the product structure of the algebra. And of course, uh, I mean, this uh, Oshield complex is exactly what you were uh, looking for. So uh, this is the complete picture. So I just told you something about the first quarter, but you can continue. And uh, also the rest of the construction can be described in this language of uh, spectral triples. And it's all coherent uh, in the sense that also for the, the BRST complex, this can be viewed as some kind of Hoshin complex, uh, all fitting together. So of course, that's not the end of the story, uh, because um, yeah, there is st uh, still a lot to do. Namely, um, this was just uh, for a finite spectral triple. 
So uh, what happens if uh, we actually consider spectral triples where the algebra is not finite anymore, but is, um, I mean, an infinite dimensional one, maybe related to a uh, uh, spin uh, manifold, and we still need to go quantum. So that was just a classical construction, so the answer is what happens if our action functional actually has to solve the, the quantum master equation instead of the classical one. So these are the questions for the future, but for now we'll just stop here and thanks all of you for your attention. I have a stupid question. Uh, so we have these Hochschild complexes. Uh, for me, Hochschild complexes, it's about deformation theory. What do they deform in your case? Uh, I mean, no, in this case, I mean, I'm just speaking about uh, the basic notion involving an algebra. But can you interpret cohomologies in, in terms of deformations? Uh, like Hochschild cohomologies, they, they describe deformation, right? That's sort of algebra. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I haven't went, in, I mean, I didn't go in along this direction. So, okay. yeah. Thank you. Uh, can I ask a question? Um, do you have a clue what happens if you look at gravity, for example? Ooh. <laughs> That's a really long shot to go. So, of course, that is like in a really future dream, but uh, I, no, for now, I have really no idea. Any other question? If not, let's thank Robert again. Okay, so the next speaker is also on site and, and ready to, to take over. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Azat Gainutidinov. Thank you. He will tell us about uh, three-dimensional topological quantum field theories from non-semi-simple modular categories. Uh, thank you for the presentation and thank Thank you for letting me speak here, and thank you, thank you for coming at such a late uh, hour. Uh, the subject of my talk will be three-dimensional um, um, uh, topological quantum field theories, and um, I, I'm going to talk about um, uh, a new construction of such topological quantum field theories that arise from non-semi-simple modular categories. You can think about them kind of non-unitary quantum field theories. And this is a joint work with uh, Marco Dorenzi, uh, Nathan Gier, but, uh, Bertrand Patiro, and uh, Ingo Runkel. And, um, right, let me start with, uh, so it, 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 it's uh, algebraic construction, which is based on some ideas of, uh, uh, to arrive, uh, let me, uh, it works. Does it work? No. I don't see it from here, but. I, I don't see it from there. Right, uh, so let me start with, uh, um, just review you what is 2QFT for me. It's uh, paraphrasing ATIA, it's just a symmetric tensor functor from a category of n plus one cobordisms to the category of k vector spaces. In simple terms, it means that uh, it's a gadget that uh, tells me what vector space I associate to any n manifold and what linear map between vector spaces I associate to n plus one cobordism uh, between uh, n manifolds. And, and this type of data, it should be consistent. In particular, it should satisfy functionality conditions, which is just means that if you glue to cobordisms, uh, the linear map you get, it should be composition of linear maps of, of the cobordisms you, you, you glue together. And also disjoint, and the fact that it's tensor functor, uh, it corresponds to the, to the fact that disjoint union of two uh, n-manifolds uh, is sent to a tensor product corresponding vector space. And uh, why we like uh, TQFTs? Uh, uh, because from a mathematical point of view, they are, uh, provide us um, uh, a way to calculate uh, topological invariance of n plus one manifolds, of closed manifolds. Um, so you think about closed manifolds as a cobordism from empty to empty, 
and uh, HQ of T then gives you a linear map from ground field to itself, which is a number, and this number is your invariant. And the second thing is that uh, any TQ of T uh, in the sense of ITI, it provides you, just induce you representations of mapping class group of, of closed n manifolds. So the idea is that any mapping, any element of mapping class group of, of n, n manifolds can be represented via uh, endomorphism of a surface, so called uh, mapping cylinder, and uh, TQ of T sends it to, to a linear map. And this is actually a, a great fact because usually to construct ma representation of mapping class group, it's, it's very difficult. And if you have a TQFT, it just gives it to you. Uh, in particular, I would be interested for n equal two case. So we, we talk about two plus one TQFTs. And uh, mapping class group representations allow you to uh, also construct invariants of three manifolds by Hegart splitting. And so from now on, uh, I will talk about n equal two. And let me uh, review you a little bit, a little bit of hi history. So it starts for me from, uh, from a fundamental work of Beaton, and then uh, it was a construction by Stichem Trive, and finally Trive, who provided a TQFT construction out of an uh, algebraic gadget that's called modular category. Uh, I will call it modular fusion category. Uh, and this is exactly the same category that appear in, uh, in, um, in the previous talk of Matthias. Uh, uh, the characteristic future of them is that they are semi-simple categories. And they have uh, several layers of structures, like braiding and ribbon structure that satisfy certain non-degeneracy conditions, uh, famous uh, non-degeneracy of matrix conditions uh, by Trive. Uh, so if you have such a gadget, such a, such a category, it, uh, a Trive tells us how to construct a, a fully-fledged 2 plus 1 TQFT out of that. Uh, the examples from algebra, uh, they're based, uh, which were used initially by Rishtik and Trive, from precession theory of quantum groups at roots of unity, uh, these categories are non-semi-simple. Uh, however, you can take quotient of them, removing uh, so-called negligible morphisms, and uh, this way you get a semi-simple uh, category, uh, model of fusion category, you can use uh, to construct these TQFTs. Or what will be important for me, uh, the examples from physics, uh, they are two-dimensional rational CFTs, uh, which were also mentioned by Matthias. Uh, they are representations of so-called rational VOAs, and we have many examples of that, like lattice VOAs, minimal Verasora models, or Vesely Minaviton model, positive level. I mean, the representation theory of integrable modules for SL2 hat on positive integer level. So they are all examples of rational CFTs, uh, of rational, uh, sorry, of uh, modular fusion categories. And um, and uh, as I said, uh, having a TQFT, it, 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 it produces invariants of three manifolds. I call them Rishtik and Trife invariants and also projective representations uh, for mapping class groups uh, of surfaces in this case. Uh, and here is a, a very uh, a deep, uh, a deep aspect uh, when, 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 I, when we talk about rational vertex operator algebras and we consider a modular, tensor, modular fusion category of, of its representations. So Huang in 2008, he has proven, he has proved that um, any rational VOA, its representation category is modular. So that means that on one side, uh, due to derive uh, from a VOA, uh, from rational VOA, you have a family of uh, mapping class group representations of, of surfaces, one family. But on the other side, view, you have uh, also a family of uh, mapping class group representations on, 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 uh, of, of surfaces uh, that comes from VOA itself, because VOA have spaces of conformal blocks and on this space of conformal blocks, uh, for every genus G, we have naturally mapping class group representations that acts on, on the space of conformal blocks. And, and the fact that was proven by Huang only for genus one, uh, that these uh, two representations agree. So the one coming from Turaev, which is purely categorical, and the one coming from VOA, which is more like uh, analytical structure, uh, that these two, fa th that these two uh, uh, mapping class group representations that they uh, isomorphic for uh, whatever rational VOA. So uh, uh, this aspect I call modular the Linda formula. Uh, it's, it's, it's very, very deep property of VOAs. Um, and uh, several important properties of this type of uh, uh, TQFTs that come from uh, derived construction and using semi-simple categories is that um, uh, these representations of mapping class group, uh, dentist action, they always of finite order. So they find dimensional representations, uh, linear representation, but uh, the dentists have find orders. Uh, these invariants are not that uh, strong. For example, um, uh, restricted derived invariants are known that they do not distinguish some land spaces. Okay, let's, uh, this is a property to, I wanted to mention. Um, right, and the natural question is, um, 
Can we maybe avoid uh, taking this quotient operation when I remove negligible morphisms to simplify the category? And if so, uh, um, will we get uh, maybe new and, and better invariants? Um, and it, when I say to avoid the quotient operation, it means that I should be able somehow to work with non-semi-simple category. And drive construction work, works only for semi-simple category. So uh, and in the in, in middle of the 90s, Lubashenko came out with uh, a proper definition of non-semi-simple modal tensor categories. And let me give you a proper definition. So I will start with the ribbon category. Uh, any any modal tensor category is, um, is ribbon. So And ribbon means that I have uh, my objects, like, like for example, representations, I can, I can multiply. So there is a tensor product with a tensor unit. So this is just tensor category uh, plus a duality, duality morphisms. So every object has dual, have evaluation, covaluation morphisms. And now uh, the ribbon structure, it's that, it's, first of all, I should have braiding, which means that my multiplication in the category is commutative up to isomorphism, which is braiding isomorphism. Plus I have twist isomorphisms. And they should satisfy certain natural uh, axioms. And um, these axioms basically allow me to use the graphical presentations. Um, so the idea is that ribbon category was, uh, the concept of ribbon category basically was designed so that uh, this is gadget that produces you invariants of frame links. That's why, uh, um, that why uh, we can talk about uh, uh, diagrams of links and, uh, and talk about braidings. So the, the braiding I will, de I will, I will denote uh, with a braid and evaluation correlation with ca caps and caps. And as I said, the topological meaning of axioms of ribbon category is that uh, it ensures invariance under isotopy and uh, uh, frame that the master moves of, 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 of diagrams representing my structural maps. Okay, uh, and now going back to modular tensor category. So the general definition, I will not assume semi-simplicity, so it's quite general definition. It's factorizable ribbon category. So it's ribbon category with a certain condition uh, that uh, it's factorizable. What means factorizable is that I have no non-trivial transparent objects. What is transparent object? Transparent object in a category is such an object such that uh, double, uh, that monodromy, as you can see this double braiding, it's trivial with every object in the category. Uh, that's why it's called transparent, sort of. You can, uh, you can uh, straighten the lines. Uh, and the category is called factorizable if only trivial, like if, it's, if transpar all transparent objects are direct sums of tensor unit. In particular, if category is uh, semi-simple, then it's original definition of drive. Uh, this was, this, this is, can be proven. Uh, and then Lubashenko came out with a definition of modular tensor category. It was a different one, uh, but equivalent in 94, and Lubashenko uh, uh, told us how to construct invariants of certain invariants of three manifolds and uh, projective representations of mapping class groups out of such a gadget. Uh, it can be semi-simple or non-semi-simple. If it's semi-simple, uh, Lubashenko's construction is just Rishtik and Turayev construction. If it's, if it's non-semi-simple, it's something new. Uh, again, the examples coming from quantum group representation theory, or uh, what is more important for me is where my, my motivation comes, came from uh, in studying modal tensor categories is uh, logarithmic CFT. So it's certain type of non unitary conformal field theories uh, with, logarithmic, uh, uh, with logarithmic terms in operator product expansions. Um, and such CFTs, um, uh, the corresponding uh, vertex operator algebra that, be that sits behind the CFTs, um, it, its category of presentations is, is, is non semi simple and it's believed that it's always modular. Uh, in particular, the, the best examples are symplectic fermions and triplet W algebra for, for ROM 1, P LCFT models. And of course, there is an interesting question of studying uh, a logarithmic version of modular Velinda formula. So, this is, so we, have, we have many, many examples of non semi simple modular tensor categories. And, and the question of, of course, uh, does the Lubashenko uh, construction uh, carry uh, more topological information? Uh, than the semi-simple one, and can we extend the Lubashenko construction? Because Lubashenko didn't produce the QFT, but uh, so, and it was uh, this big problem that um, can we extend his invariants into a proper TQFT? And uh, the answer is, uh, is no, because uh, um, if I take, if I think about TQFT in terms of ATR, so the axioms of TQFT tell me that if such a TQFT extending Lubashenko invariants would exist, then dimensions of all state spaces would be zero. 
It just comes from the fact that the Lubashenko invariant of any manifold with positive Betty number is zero. In particular, uh, dimension of any uh, vector space associated to, to a surface should be Lubashenko invariant of surface times S1, but it has positive number, beta number zero, or positive, so it should be zero. Um, and so this is a problem, and um, my to uh, sort of our work was, uh, uh, we came to, to, I mean, these problems can be fixed, uh, and um, uh, our new TQFT construction is about uh, basically how to solve these problems. And um, the, the, the central role is played by projective objects in a non-semi-simple category, because projective objects, they are sort of generators of the category. And uh, the, the problem with initial Lubashenko construction is that uh, standard trace, because when we construct invariants of links or, or nodes, we use, we, we use a trace construction, categorical trace. Uh, the categorical trace is, is zero, uh, on every endomorphism of projective object. Uh, and that's um, the, the key point of, of, of these abstractions to extend to TQFT. So we, we came with, uh, I mean, it, it's, uh, the idea is to use another trace. It's, it's called modified trace. You can think about this as kind of uh, appropriate renormalization of categorical trace. Um, so the, the, the modified trace is defined uh, axiomatically in terms of it, it has to be cyclic and it has to be, it has to be consistent with duality in the category. So it, it, it has the same properties as categorical trace, but uh, defined axiomatically. And this way we, 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 um, we construct a new invariant. Uh, we call them renormalized Lubashenko invariants. And based on these invariants, we were able to construct a TQFT. Maybe let me uh, uh, tell you an important thing that Every, uh, um, with Ingo Runkel, I, I proved uh, uh, a few years ago uh, a theorem that every modular tensor category has such a unique uh, a non-zero modified trace, which replaces categorical trace, on this projective ideal of, project, of, of projective objects in the category, and it's non-degenerate. That's a key point that allows you to construct uh, TQFT out of this renormalized Lubashenko invariants. And, uh, okay, I will skip uh, the way, uh, I mean, how, how do we construct? Uh, and this is um, the theorem that, um, that we proved in the first paper that uh, there exists a 2 plus 1 TQFT from a cobordism category. Uh, it's a slightly modified cobordism category, not the one I was talking about. Uh, it's decorated cobordisms, uh, and there is a certain admissibility condition. Um, anyway, but uh, it's, it's, it's a good cobordism category. In particular, it contains all mapping cylinders, for example. So, uh, and there is a proper 2 plus 1 TQFTs, so symmetric monoidal functor to vector spaces, such that it extends this renormalized Lubashenko invariance and it, it, it produces projective presentations uh, of mapping class group introduced by Lubashenko in 94. So this, uh, right, and uh, the, yeah, let me finish with the property of this um, TQFT. So we, don't, we, we didn't just prove it, but we, we provide a combinatorial construction of such TQFT that allows us to study uh, mapping class group representations, and we were able to prove, at least in certain type of examples, that the fantastic property of this of these TQFTs is that mapping class group representations induced by them, uh, that all dentists have infinite order, so they they, they contain um, a new information comparing to semi simple one, and they do distinguish land spaces, for example. Thank you. So questions from the audience? Everybody's getting tired. Go ahead. Uh, yes, hi. Um, these TQFTs, you construct them using some kind of Rechtik and Turaev type? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a restricted type type idea uh, via surgery presentation of three manifolds. So you, we first construct uh, invariants of three manifolds. I call them the renormalized Lubashenko invariants. So they're, they're better, they're different than Lubashenko invariants, but they have better properties. And then we use universal TQFT construction. It's due to uh, Blanchet, uh, Masbaum, Vogel, uh, old paper. So uh, if you have an invariance of closed three manifolds that satisfy certain properties, then you can always cons extend them to a TQFT. It's so-called universal TQFT construction. And, and, and the invariants we constructed, they, they satisfy these properties, and, uh, and one can get um, a universal TQFT construction. But the good thing also, one can actually calculate, for example, state spaces. 
It's, it's not just existence results, but also it's constructible. Right, so sorry, did you say state sums or? Uh, no, no, state spaces. Oh, sorry, yeah. yeah. So is there a, a version of the state sum, so the Turaviru state sum construction, which works for these non semi simple cases? Uh, it's, it's a version of, it's not, it's not Turai Viro, it's, it's, it's a version of restricting Turai construction. Yeah, yeah, I, I know, but, but um, some modular tensor categories, namely the ones that are the Drinfeld Center, also admit the Turai Viro uh, construction, which yeah. is just a square of the yes, restricting yes, Turai yes, one. Yes. So is there a version of this uh, Turai Viro state sum construction which works for these non semi simple cases, like for the case of the, well? Uh, do, 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 do you know there is Turaviro construction for non No, I, I'm, I'm asking if you know no, it. No, no, it's more complicated. Turaviro is more complicated. Uh, I think people are still working on that. Okay. But it's, it's more complicated. Okay, uh, I see. To, to, Thanks. To start with Turaviro construction uh, for, for non semi simple case, yeah. Okay, there's also no questions online, so let's thank Azad for his nice talk. So I guess, I think the next talk is online. So it's the fifth talk, so I, I suggest we make a little break, five minute break after this talk. Okay, but let's still continue. So, so now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Gabriele Rembardo. He will tell us about singularity modules for a finely algebras. Yes, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, so good day, everyone. Thank you very much uh, to the speakers for making all of this possible and also for accepting this um, uh, contributed talk. So this is joint work with uh, Giovanni Felder, as you can read at the bottom of this slide. I will basically introduce uh, modules for affinely algebras with generalized Verma modules and then relate them to uh, conformal blocks in the WZW model in presence of irregular singularities for certain meromorphic connections. So uh, we are going to have three parts. First, I will review uh, the standard story, so the usual conformal blocks uh, and their relation to uh, connections with regular singularities. And then we will move on to irregular extensions and I will have a conclusion, an outlook with uh, open questions, essentially. So. Um, let me start by introducing the first ingredient we need. I will need two ingredients from the classical case. The first one is this very particular Hamiltonian system you see here in this equation. It's the Schlesinger system. So it depends on an n-tuple of elements from a Lie algebra, G gothic, and from a, a configuration of an n-tuple of points uh, in the complex plane. And you see that uh, in the formula, I am using some uh, non-degenerate invariant product on the Lie algebra. So I am taking some complex quadratic Lie algebra, which we should assume to be either semi-simple or GLM for today. That's, that's good enough. We should also identify G with the dual using this product because then we have a Poisson manifold and we can actually talk about Hamiltonian systems. So this is the first thing I want to have a look at. It's a well-known integrable system. Um, and how does it relate to uh, connections in this way? So this, this system actually controls the uh, isomonodromic deformations of logarithmic connections on the uh, trivial principle G bundle over the Riemann sphere. So uh, I mean that you take a group integrating G and you consider connections of this form defined by some meromorphic one form. And in this form, you now see the capital lambdas before, which are the residues, and the TIs, which are going to be the positions of the simple pose. So as you move this, uh, the monodromy data, namely the representation of the fundamental group of the punctured sphere with the pole removes will vary. But if you uh, evolve along the flow of the previous system, then this will actually be fixed. So that's why they're called isomonodromic deformations. And the second ingredient I need is the moduli space of such connections. So we should consider isomorphism classes of such, uh, or gauge classes, if you prefer. And we should maybe uh, restrict the residues to live in some prescribed orbit, which I denote OI. And then one can actually show that the moduli space of such classes, which is this open Dirham space, MDR, is just the symplectic quotient of the product of orbits with respect to the diagonal action of the group there. So we have some classical 
uh, intractable Hamiltonian system and this classical space. And now I want to go to their quantum versions, which are both well known, of course. So the quantum analog of the system is the KZ connection, Nishita Molochikov. I just recall that it is some flat connection on this trivial bundle you see here, whose fiber is uh, uh, the uh, tensor power of the universal enveloping algebra of G. And it is defined by certain Hamiltonians here in this equation. The only thing we need to see is that they are defined using the action on the ith and the jth slot of the canonical tensor of the quadratic Lie algebra, this capital omega. And this prefactor, I will say something about just in the next slide. So this uh, is an integrable Hamiltonian system on the quantum side, so that's why it's a flat connection equivalently. And it controls uh, the linear partial differential equations in the genus zero with the Minonovic of Witten model satisfied by correlation functions. So uh, I would like to think of them as quantum isomonodromy equations for the reason I'm going to tell you in a while, but essentially because uh, they are a quantization of the equation given by the Schlesinger system. Uh, so now let's see the second ingredient in the quantum case. We have the quantum system. We need somehow the quantum moduli spaces. So uh, I recall here that KZ can be obtained by the action of the Shugawara operator L minus uh, one, one generator of the Viazoro algebra, acting on Verma modules for the affine Lie algebra G hat. So the central extension of the loop, loop algebra of G, uh, which are defined in turn by a certain weight uh, uh, lambda i in the dual of a cartan sub algebra t that you fix. And then, of course, there is a level kappa, which should be non critical, so different from the opposite of the dual Coxeter number, as we saw in last equation, because, uh, because I had that denominator there. So, this is something uh, well known. And then, conformal blocks today, I'm just going to define them as the coin variants uh, of this tensor product of uh, affine Lie algebra modules for the action of rational functions on Riemann sphere with values in the Lie algebra G. So you can take invariance there after taking Laurent development and acting on the modules. And you can actually show that this is the same as taking the coinvariance for constant functions. So just the G coinvariance, uh, where you take the tensor product of the finite Verma modules. So the Verma modules, which are sit naturally inside the uh, affine ones. Now, how do I relate this to the classical picture? I need somehow to have a quantization statement. So um, first, I can consider equivalently this Schlesinger classical Hamiltonians as taking values in algebraic functions on G to the power N, so into some symmetric algebra. And then it was shown by Reshetikin and Harna that actually the KZ Hamiltonians quantize the Schlesinger ones. And in my notation, this basically follows from the fact that the uh, canonical tensor is obtained as the natural deformation quantization of this function that associates to every residue, just uh, their pairing uh, with the non-degenerate product. So this is the first step. And the second step is that actually the space of conformal blocks, so this tensor product of modules or rather the covariant part provides a deformation quantization of the Dirham space. And the main idea here is just that if you take the annihilator of suitable quotients of the finite Verma modules, you will find ideal which deform those of uh, functions that vanish on these orbits you've chosen before. The only thing I need to tell you here is how to relate uh, the orbits, so the residues I've chosen, with the weights I chose for these uh, Verma modules. And this is done uh, by using the uh, standard pairing that actually defines so by the standard cost cycle that defines the affine Lie algebra. So there is a natural pairing between G-valued meromorphic functions and the G-valued meromorphic one forms given by the uh, product you fixed on the Lie algebra and by uh, taking residues. And this maps one weight element in the dual of the Cartan to something of the form capital lambda over Z dZ, which is a residue term for a connection with a simple pole. And so our idea to go on was to consider um, not just residue terms, but principal parts or polar parts of connections with higher order poles and apply this duality to get some element in some dual space to define generalized modules. So this is what we would like to do and what I would like to uh, briefly discuss in this second part. So here we now deal with the irregular singularities. We will see new systems and new connections. And I'm actually starting from uh, the quantum Hamiltonian system. So the quantum Hamiltonian system is the following. 
it's given by these Hamiltonians here. Uh, so again, we don't care too much for the particular formula, but with respect to KZ, you should know that there is a new sum over positive integers N and L. There is some coefficient. There are higher negative powers of, you know, the difference of the coordinates uh, of the positions of the mark points. And then this new uh, quadratic tensor omega and L, which is now a quadratic tensor in the loop algebra, where I put uh, positive powers then of the local coordinate and I still sum over some orthonormal basis of G. Uh, so this is what I want to consider. And to have a connection, we do the following. We will fix a positive integer P and then we will basically take a quotient. So for such a positive integer, you consider this algebra GP, which is a quotient of the algebra of positive currents with respect to its ideal of currents of order at least P. So you see that G1 is just G, and then it's, uh, you know, it's big early algebras that actually contain G as a factor, and that can be written as a semi-direct product of G with something else. So now these Hamiltonians are going to give me a connection on this trivial bundle where the fiber is, is still some tensor power of a universal enveloping algebra, but using this deep early algebras GP. And this was also introduced by Reshetikin, who showed that this is also giving some flat connection. I will call it the irregular KZ connection. And it is then easy to show that it's still G invariant, just as KZ. So this is the quantum system we want to have. And now, uh, instead of having the modules, first I will consider the classical counterpart, so the semi-classical limit. One can show that the semi-classical limit of this Hamiltonian system is uh, the system of Bernard Clares. So it's a system controlling uh, also isomonodromic deformations of connections, but this time, importantly, as we wanted, with arbitrary singularities on Riemann sphere. So now the system controls uh, deformations along which Stokes state of the connections are uh, fixed. And we can still consider their moduli space, where now instead of fixing residue orbits, we will fix uh, orbits for principal parts of the connections. And we have a similar, I mean, the same exact description of the moduli space as a product of such orbits divided by the action of the constant group uh, as shown by uh, Bolch in several of his works uh, starting from GLM and then uh, other complex reductive groups. So uh, I restate what our idea was just to reiterate, we will now consider principal parts of such a connection call it A in presence of a pole of order P, some positive integer. And we will map this under the duality before to some element in the dual of this algebra GP. And then we use these dual elements to define modules for these Lie algebras and get some results about them. This is uh, what we did. So to do this, we need to, basically it's two steps. The first one, so the idea was to introduce the good subalgebra of the affine Lie algebras. So consider please this that I call the singularity Lie algebra, which uses some positive Borel inside G the same ideal as before and the central element of the affine Lie algebra. This is now a descending tower of subalgebras such that uh, for, sig for P equal one, you just find the affine positive Borel and characters are coded precisely by levels as before. And then what I wanted, so elements in duals of uh, deeper Cartan subalgebras TP, which are defined totally analogously to the GP I had uh, before. So this is somehow now coding principal parts of connections with semi-simple coefficients. And then we do the most natural stuff. So we induce representations. We consider the one dimensional module defined by a character. We induce from SP to the affine Lie algebra. And this is the affine singularity module. And then analogously for a finite module GP, we induce using uh, uh, this time just the alpha part and we induce from uh, the positive Borel algebra uh, with the same quotient construction as before. And actually this finite singularity module is naturally a subspace of the affine one, just by acting with the positive currents on the canonical generator one tensor one in this product here. And so this very natural idea actually turns out to be, uh, I mean, a strong one enough to be able to prove a few results. So I will now list them. Uh, these singularity modules are smooth, so I can have an action of the sugar war operators in particular. They are diagonalizable with respect to the action of the carton, and the uh, weight spaces are finite dimensional for the finite uh, singularity modules. Then, moreover, the canonical generator is an irregular state in the terminology of Gaiotto and Teschner. So, this means that if you consider the sugar war operators, there is a range of them 
which have uh, this um, vector as a common eigenvector and all the, which are uh, above them just kill it. And finally, uh, we do the same as we did for, so as, uh, as we were instructed to do in the case of the Verma, so we consider the tensor product of such modules. We take covariance for uh, G-valued rational functions, and we prove that this is the same as the covariance for the tensor product of finite singularity modules, only with constant functions. And so this is what now we put forward as a prototype, as a mathematically rigorous prototype for irregular conformal blocks in the genus zero WZ and W model. Uh, the other results we are able to prove are that, uh, again, we can take the operator L minus one and uh, use it to act and define some connection on this bundle of conformal blocks uh, as soon as we move the variation, the, the positions of the poles. And we actually get a generalization of the irregular uh, KZ connection because well, now we can have a non-trivial action on the module at infinity. We prove that this generalized connection is also flat and G invariant. So this seems to be working. Uh, after a reduction, of course, it is clear at the level of the uh, Sugawara operator. And so at the reduction, uh, we give an explicit formula without using the representation. That's why this is non-trivial. And finally, we uh, slightly vary our setup uh, and we generalize the dynamical KZ connection of Felder and uh, collaborators, which was introduced in a similar context and which is related to connections with the poles of order two. I would just make a note that this is not uh, uh, equivalent to uh, this connection of Resha Tikin because uh, there, are, there is no statement, as far as we know, that this construction is equivalent under the Möbius transformation of the sphere. So one cannot just move infinity to a point at finite distance and then get back to the previous uh, case. What we prove, however, is that for this irregular Gezi connection, one does have uh, equivariance with respect to the affine transformation of the complex affine line inside of the complex projective line. And this is actually um, all the results I wanted to talk about. So let me now conclude with the last slide where I basically talk about uh, two open problems. So there are two main problems we are, so with that we pose ourselves. The first one is that here we were just moving the positions of the poles, but in this setup of bulge, one can also vary the uh, coefficients controlling uh, the highest irregular part of the connection, what is called the irregular types. And so we would like to also have a quantum connections along these deformations. And the starting point probably would be to transform this system of Clarès using the Free Laplace transform, which is also known as the Harnad duality in this uh, isomonodromic literature. So this will turn uh, the deformation of the Mark points into deformations of irregular types. And then we could try to quantize that. And lastly, uh, we should try and compute the monodromy of this new quantum connection. So uh, a priori, this would, would yield the generalization of the conod Greenfeld theorem, which I recall related the um, monodromy of KZ to the uh, representation of the Artin-Braid group obtained from the universal quantum R matrix of the jimbo Greenfeld quantum group. So we would get automorphisms of these irregular conformal blocks or these universal enveloping algebras of the deeper ones. And so with these two problems, uh, I am done and I thank you very much uh, for your attention. Yeah. Question. Is it, Albert, is there is there any question from from the the chat? So there is a question from Fabrizio Del Monte. Um, so how much is known about the non-zero genus isomonodromy and the regular yeah, yeah, version so of the KZB equation? Right, right. So uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is more complicated. So, I mean, I can say that one thing which is uh, really more complex in the higher genus case is that uh, uh, the difference between the modular space of connections living on uh, holomorphically trivial bundles and the modular space of all connection is much bigger. So here I was only considering the trivial principle bundle and it turns out that in genus zero, this defines an open subspace within the whole of the moduli space. So I can use it to approximate the full moduli space and then all this theory goes through. I have these nice descriptions in terms of orbits and I can quantize them and so on. In higher genus, this uh, breaks. So actually, if you impose this um, triviality of the bundle, then you get to a positive co-dimension locus within the moduli space. 
So uh, this is going to be different. And so I am not sure about the, the quantum version of that. Uh, but I can say that the classical version, of course, this is perfectly uh, known and done. There is a, a, a complete understanding of the, you know, of the symplectic interpretation of the isomonodromic deformation in all genera for any complex reductive group uh, and so on. Any other question? Okay, if not, let's thank Gabriele. Bye. And, uh, so uh, as I said, I propose we have a very quick break and we start, uh, let's say at 10 past. So at 8.10, we restart for the second part. Thank you. Um. Yeah. Okay. Test. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Yeah. Awesome. So, do I actually? Can I actually read? Yeah. This is, it's loud when I drink. <laughs> um, I'm just going to test something. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to have you change from the first to the second slide and say uh, hi. Hi. It, but and just so I can listen to see. All right. Like, yes. I'll tell you, I'll show you. This is a test. This is another test. Now here is lagging quite a lot. But yeah, yeah, I went back and forth a couple of times, but now it's still in the second. Yeah. Well, it should be in the first, yeah. I, I'm gonna look here, it's just uh, for the people at home.
sometimes if you uh, unshare and share again, it refreshes. Yeah. Okay. Ciao Alberto. So our next speaker is Michele Schiavina from ETH Zurich, and we'll talk about Rails Zeta function from field theory. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to the organizers for a very challenging day of, of talks uh, and for allowing me to uh, present this work, which um, uh, was a surprising combination uh, of two fields of research. Uh, one is dynamical systems, and the other one is quantum classical and quantum field theory. So um, the plan today is to describe a field theoretic interpretation of a function, it's called rel zeta function, for chaotic dynamical systems. And reformulating these terms a conjecture, long-standing conjecture of Fried. Now, if it's uh, too late, you can stick to the take-home message, uh, which is here. And the point is that I will try to uh, explain that uh, both the analytic torsion and the rel zeta function uh, are ways to compute the partition function of uh, theory, which is topological and it's called BF theory, uh, in different gauge fixings. Um, now, if we believe that the partition function of a quantum field theory should be independent of this choice of gauge, then uh, we should believe that these two quantities are equivalent. And this was Fritz's conjecture. So uh, this is a joint work uh, with uh, Charles Hartfield and Santosh Kandel. So uh, a little bit of geometric setup. Um, here we need to consider a little bit of a restrictive, uh, restrictive um, framework. So we look at an n-dimensional compact connected oriented Riemannian manifold without boundary. And uh, we look at its uh, uh, unit cotangent bundle, which is a sphere bundle. Then on top of that, we add a Hermitian vector bundle with a flat connection. Um, we do this because we want to look at uh, the twisted drum uh, complex, so we uh, associate to it, to it a representation of pi one, um, and we construct uh, the twisted drum complex as usual. Um, so on M, given this data, we can consider the geodesic flow. And um, this is a flow, it's a diffeomorphism, and its generating vector field will be denoted by xg. The first important obser observation is that um, if we denote by alpha uh, the canonical one form on the cotangent bundle restricted to uh, the sphere bundle, then uh, this triple m, xg, and alpha is a contact manifold. So here, uh, if you don't remember what a contact manifold is, the, here are the most relevant identities that will be used in what follows. Uh, in particular, this allows us to give a sort of a Hodge type decomposition of um, uh, the space of differential forms on M. And uh, I denote by omega zero K, the space of K forms, 
that are in the kernel of the contraction with, with this uh, Reeb vector field. Um, and uh, this is the decomposition. Now, if in particular G has negative sectional curvature, uh, we know that the geodesic flow has a property, uh, has the Anosov property. Now, what this means is that the tangent bundle uh, can be split into the neutral, stable, and unstable subbundles um, defined by this property. So, um, here, what, what this is saying is that in the stable bundle, the, the flow is contracting, and the unstable bundle, the flow is expanding. Um, so, well, when you have an anus of flow, the dynamical system is chaotic. This is a prototypical example of a chaotic system. Okay, this is just a, a fact, a little construction here. And uh, there is a definition um, with the setup that I described above. You can define the twisted, because we're using this twisting by the, um, the Hermitian bundle, um, the twisted rel zeta function is defined as a product over uh, closed geodesics, closed orbits of the geodesic flow um, of this formula, as you can see. And you should think of this as a way of counting geodesic lengths, more or less in the same way um, than the Riemann zeta function counts prime, or actually the Dirichlet uh, functions actually uh, resemble this, this construction a little more closely. Um, now, it was uh, proved by uh, several authors in different uh, scenarios that convergence is assured for the um, real part of lambda uh, much larger than one, and um, there is a meromorphic extension to the whole C. So this is just to say it makes sense to look at this function. Um, well, accidentally, on, with the same geometrical data, we can define uh, another object, which is the analytic torsion, a Ratzinger torsion, uh, of, of the manifold, which I recall uh, in our setup is a sphere bundle. Um, and here the determinant is the regularized determinant of um, the Laplacian on K-forms to some power. This is one way of writing it. Um, but this is just to say, okay, we have this quantity on, on this manifold as well. And the conjecture due to Freed is that indeed um, the two quantities should be equivalent. Now this is absolutely non-trivial because um, the analytic torsion is a topological invariant. You define it uh, through a metric because you need to define the Laplacian. Um, but it has been shown to be uh, invariant on the choice of, of metric. On the other hand, the rel zeta function evaluated at zero, I should say, um, well, is an object that depends on a very delicate definition uh, of a dynamical system, which is chaotic, uh, counts geodesic. So this is not a very trivial statement. However, it was proven originally for hyperbolic manifolds and it was extended uh, later uh, to a number of other cases, although it's still a pretty much uh, open and interesting conjecture. So I promised a little bit of field theory. This is thematic session. session. So um, how do we introduce field theory in the game? Uh, let me start with an observation. Um, so the analytic torsion admits um, field theoretic interpretation or presentation, can be seen as the partition function for BF theory. Now, um, thanks to Roberta, we know what the BV formalism is. Uh, and well, if you have a field theory, you can phrase it in um, the BV formalism. And the output for this particular theory is what you see there. So there is a space of fields, which is a, um, a minus one shifted symplectic uh, graded manifold. Um, which is there, the uh, symplectic form, and the action functional is uh, this integral of BDA, uh, where you can see the twist uh, of uh, the Durham differential by the flat connection, 
And uh, the A's and the B's are multiplets of um, forms with a particular grading uh, expressed there. Now, gauge fixing in this setup is the choice of a Lagrangian submanifold inside uh, that space. And one can phrase the um, celebrated, famous, and uh, used everywhere Lorentz gauge uh, as, a, as a Lagrangian submanifold um, with a little bit of work. And it's an old result by Schwartz that the partition function of BF theory in this gauge fixing is the analytic torsion. Well, um, with collaborators, we actually checked that there exists another uh, Lagrangian submanifold whenever you are on a contact manifold, actually, so BF theory defined on a con contact manifold. Uh, you can take uh, this condition, so it's sort of like an axial gauge, if you want. Um, you contract um, A and B with your vector field, and you impose them to be zero. Uh, well, the, the theorem that we have is that the partition function of BF theory, if you compute it with this gauge, is the analytic torsion. And uh, let me just spend a couple of words saying that the way we do it is uh, by actually saying that the partition function is some sort of regularized uh, super determinant uh, or regu regularized determinant uh, acting on K forms. Um, here, I think there is a little typo there. Mm, but the regularization here is, is not the usual one. In order to make sense of the determinant uh, of this operator, you need to extend your regularization to um, flat regularization, flat determinants. Um, well, then, it's uh, sort of easy to conclude that uh, if you put, if you sandwich the partition function um, between the analytic torsion and uh, the Rosetta function evaluated at zero, you tentatively get the statement of the, of the conjecture. Now, uh, let me attempt a little bit of an alternative interpretation of this result. Um, well, the striking analogy here is, is this one. So you can look at the Laplacian as the square of D plus the co-differential given by a choice of a metric. Uh, or you can think of the lead derivative as uh, D plus the contraction with iota x. Now, this you can heuristically think of as a different choice of a chain contraction for your Durham complex. And, uh, well, uh, more specifically, you would like to choose, um, in the Lorentz gauge, you would like to choose, well, the RAM differential, the co-differential composed with um, the inverse of the Laplacian. And, uh, and for the real zeta function, you have this dynamical torsion um, obtained by choosing this chain contraction. Now here, of course, you need a non-degeneracy condition for this to make any sense. And indeed, in the work of people doing hard analysis, this um, non-degeneracy condition of, of the lead derivative as an operator shows up as a necessary condition. Um, okay, this is just another detail that I don't think we have time to comment on. But okay, so this gives you yet another heuristic uh, motivation of why this, this makes sense. So let me conclude with uh, a bit of perspective. So if we were in a finite dimensional scenario, um, we would get the proof by simply finding a Lagrangian homotopy between the Lagrangian given by this uh, axial gauge, contact gauge, and uh, the Lorentz gauge Lagrangian. So one way to do it this way is to try to force the system to be finite dimensional. And uh, well, we can think of um, looking at triangulations. So rephrase the problem of um, dynamical system, chaotic dynamical systems on lattices, for example, uh, graphs. If you want to stick to infinite dimensional uh, settings, um, well, we don't have an, an analog uh, of the BV theorem that works every time uh, 
bulletproof. Um, so you need to work a bit more. And uh, well, one idea is to borrow the microlocal techniques that are being used in the uh, dynamical system, the field of dynamical systems, to try to regularize the quantum BV data and define it. Um, however, uh, this is my point, I, I think that field theory will allow us to predict uh, deep mathematical statements in uh, the field of uh, dynamical systems if we exploit um, this analogy. So of course we need uh, an appropriate rigorous uh, regularization scheme to uh, translate these heuristics into theorems. And uh, the hint is that it, it should be compatible with the type of regularizations that we do. So this uh, flat regularization instead of the usual zeta function regularization. Um, bridging you know, between these two worlds, I think, will be useful as well to access these analytical tools that could be uh, very helpful to address more general questions in quantum field theory. And uh, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Are there questions from the audience? Maybe have one question. How did Fried come to this conjecture? Uh, well, <laughs> no, I, I, there is a quick answer. No, I don't, think, I don't think it is, to be honest. I think he was studying uh, uh, other type of dynamical systems, and he saw some. But I don't want to speak for him, so I, I, I should say I don't know. OK. Are there questions from? No. no. OK, so then we can uh, thank the speaker again. And we can move to the next speaker, who I think is online. Okay, so uh, the next speaker is Nicolo Drago. Uh, he's talking on Ricci flow and algebraic quantum field theory uh, from uh, International Conference Center. Uh, sorry, yeah, Nicolo, from. Uh, oh. Uh, oh. University of Atizina. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, the University of Trento, sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. So start. Okay, uh, thanks. And thanks also for the opportunity of having this talk. So yeah, um, going directly to the, to the topic. So um, yeah, so the Ricci flow and algebraic quantum field theory. So the Ricci flow uh, is, flow known uh, in, by mathematicians. It was introduced by Hamilton in the 80s and then exploited by Perman. Uh, basically, it's a flow of Riemannian matrix uh, on a smooth manifold uh, M. So basically, you take a one parameter group of Riemannian metric, uh, which depends on the smooth parameters, and then you require these parameters to uh, the derivative with respect to these parameters to uh, be proportional to the Ricci flow of the, of the metric in itself. And notably, this, this, um, this flow was known also by physicists. Actually, it, was, it appeared in a previous work by Friedan uh, in the 80s, where basically Friedan he derives, he derived the, the Ricci flow from the analysis of the, uh, the anomalous scaling of a physical model known with the name of nonlinear sigma model. So uh, within this talk, I would like to somehow uh, sketch the way you can make this uh, derivation over there uh, slightly more rigorous within a framework known with the name of algebraic quantum field theory. So I should say this, is a, uh, this talk is a, uh, it's based on a published paper uh, together with Mauro Carfora, Claudio da Piaggi, and Paolo Rinaldi, all of them uh, from the University of Pavia. And yeah, let's get started with the contents of this talk. So I will spend a few words about the nonlinear sigma model. And I will definitely spend most of my time in sketching how the algebraic approach provides all the ingredients from which you can derive this uh, no, a Ricci flow from the nonlinear sigma models. 
I will definitely have no time to speak about big powers, but of course you can ask for them. Okay, so the non, the non linear sigma models. So uh, they are basically defined out of this uh, triple of geometrical data. So here you have a two dimensional Riemannian manifold. You can think of it as the source manifold. Um, here you have another finitely dimensional Riemannian manifold, the target manifold, and a smooth map between these two manifolds. Out of this data, you can build up the, the harmonic Lagrangian density, which is defined here. Um, this is a um, nonlinear Lagrangian density for the kinetic configuration of psi. And for this reason, this is typically um, studied by taking a process of linearization. So we then take psi also to be part of the geometrical data and we linearize around fixed psi and we get a linearized Lagrangian density where now this phi is a certain vector field on, on a certain vector bundle. Uh, it's uh, now, this phi is now the kinetic um, configuration of the theory. So here I wrote the, the, the linearization up to a se at second order in the, the parameter of the expansion, which appears here. And you see, I mean, the details are not really important, but you see the, the theory, the Lagrangian here, it's quadratic. This is what uh, everything that matters for, for the derivation we are interested in. In particular, there are these two terms which are uh, actually important. The first one is simply a constant term. And the second one is quadratic in the fields. And you see here, it appears this tensor over there, which is the Riemann tensor. And this will play a role in reducing the Ricci flow. There is a linear term which absolutely play no role, so for the rest of the talk will be neglected. And this kinetic term over there, it's somehow quite important. It will be used to construct certain algebraic structure, um, but for the derivation of the Ricci flow, only these two terms are really important. In a way, they are the, the interacting part of this Lagrangian which really matters. Now, up to the details, the most important thing of this linearized Lagrange intensity, it's this very trivial scaling invariance property, which will be used uh, in, in a second. Okay, so um, how does, how did uh, Frieden derive the, the, the Ricci flow out of this model? Well, the basic point, uh, the basic ingredients are the following. So he, he treated the, 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 non -linear, the linearized nonlinear sigma model as a uh, statistical field theory. So at a certain stage, he replaced the classical kinetic configuration with some uh, quantum or statistical configuration phi. So he basically introduced fluctuations in the model. Um, within this fluctuate, uh, fluctuating model, he still has the, the possibility of scaling the theory. And most notably, uh, while the classical Lagrangian was scaling invariant, the, the quantum Lagrangian is not. And nevertheless, one can compute the scaling of the, the scaled um, quantum Lagrangian and invoking a property which goes by the name of either universality or naturality. Uh, the freedom claimed that uh, by scaling the Lagrangian density, what you get is something which really resembles the, the previous Lagrangians namely it has the same analytical dependence as the previous one, but now you get different parameters uh, instead of the previous one. So in a way, this is to say the, the anomalous scaling of this Lagrangian is somehow absorbed um, within the parameter of the theory. And then of course you can you have to compute these parameters and at the end you find the correct result by obtaining that the, the metric G go, uh, gets shifted by exactly the right amount uh, you need. So here, uh, once here you take the logarithmic lambda derivative, you get exactly the Ricci flow. So this is very sketchy. And I just now want to, to show you how all these, um, yeah, all these three ingredients appears once you, you look for the algebraic approach, uh, yeah, possibly avoiding the, the unknown details. Okay. so. I have to say the algebraic approach as for starters, it's an approach where you study physical system by essentially studying what you can measure on the system. And typically what you can measure of the system are observables which 
typically forms an algebra. So the idea uh, to study the nonlinear sigma model is by introducing a suitable algebra uh, for, the, for the observable of the system. And this algebra contains, uh, this is what I claim, the ingredients of fluctuation I was mentioning before. So just to, to, to be a little bit more concrete, the, the algebra of observable is very simple to, to construct. It's simply generated by polynomial functional on the field configuration phi. So this is what we needed for, for the construction. And it comes equipped with a commutative product defined by parametrices for the kinetic operator we have seen so far. So this is sort of Laplacian. So here the parametrices are inverses up to smooth terms. And I didn't uh, wrote the, um, the product for a generic functional here. You see it in action for two uh, very simple functionals. And you see that, that this product is a sort of commutative deformation of uh, the pointwise product defined over here. Now, the annoying point is that the parametrices is somehow non-unique. You get uh, um, an entire affine space, uh, uh, an entire affine spaces of, of parametrices. Um, however, uh, the algebras constructed with two parametrices turn out to be isomorphic, and the isomorphism is quite explicit. So, in a way you can define the uh, obtained algebra by essentially quoting out, uh, by essentially recollecting all algebras with different parametrices and um, imposing uh, and exploiting the isomorph uh, isomorphism for two different parametrices. Uh, crucially, this isomorphism is not the identity. This will provide some annoying feature. So, well, annoying, but still interesting. Um, okay, a second ingredient for this theory, uh, the, uh, for the derivation was the scaling. So here we need to somehow uh, be able to perform a scaling of our theory, which means we have to be able to speak about the algebra at different scales. This is rather simple. So we simply define the algebra at different scales. This algebra depends on the parameters as the algebra we uh, described so far with the scaled parameters. So here it's simply only gamma has changed. And nicely enough, there is a star isomorphism which connects the algebras at two different scales. So we can essentially map the theory at different scales in a, in a isomorphic, or isomorphic way. Okay, and then we have these last mysterious ingredients, which means is, uh, which is this universality uh, or covariance, if you wish. And Okay, the, the idea, very loosely speaking, is that within the algebra A, there are observables, but the observable you are really interested to are the local and covariance ones. I'm not really providing the proper definition, but essentially uh, the idea is to, to formulate the notion of local and covariant uh, elements in terms of uh, natural transformation between appropriate functors. But just to stick to, to the explicit examples, a local and covariant observable, it's simply the observable which is near a single field. That's a very simple uh, but useful local and covariant uh, element. Whereas, for example, if you would like to construct the square of a field in a local and covariant way, well, you are forced at least to add this constant term into the definition. So this phi square, with the double dots, which means quick ordering, uh, has to be defined at least with this uh, constant correction over there. Otherwise, it would fail to, to fulfill this local and covariant uh, definition over there. And now, uh, once we have these two elements, these two definitions over there, we can also define the interacting Lagrangian, the part of the Lagrangian we have seen so far, which I claim it was the interesting part, namely the constant part plus the um, quadratic one. And we uh, define it as a local and covariant observable by inserting the local and covariant square, v square here, instead of the pointwise product. Notice this, um, this interacting Lagrangian somehow depends on phi square, on the notion of phi square we've chosen, but the final result won't uh, the final result, the derivation of the Ricci flow, won't depend on these choices. Okay, so 
here is the main uh, results. So uh, given a local and covariant observable, we can scale it by this process. So we have a local and covariant observable O, we scale it um, by a factor of lambda by simply considering the same local and covariant observable with uh, parameters scaled and then map it to the previous algebra. Once we uh, use this definition for scaling, then we can go for the scaling of the interacting Lagrangian. And then uh, the construction is quite explicit. So we, you can really compute the scaling and find what was claimed to be true, namely that the, the scaled Lagrangian is as the same form of the unscaled Lagrangian. But now uh, in the, in the in this functional over there, there appears a different metric G here. And this metric has been in shifted exactly by this factor over there. And once we have that, well, then you can say, okay, I take the derivative with respect to log lambda and at least up to higher order in this parameter nu, I find that this metric over there really evolves according to the Ricci flow equation. Um, I don't have the time probably to discuss this, but uh, one should really be aware that even for the, the definition of this Lagrangian density depends on our notion of the phi square, uh, these uh, findings here, so the, this correction over there is really independent on the particular choice we have over there. So in this sense, the derivation of the Ricci flow does not depend on the choice of the phi square we have. Uh, yeah, I think I'm mainly done. So yeah, so very briefly the conclusion. So we have somehow uh, provided a framework where we can make somehow rigorous this claim of the derivation of the Ricci flow from the anomalous scaling of the nonlinear schema model. And the nice point is that once we are in this framework, we can go say uh, to higher order in the parameter nu, which was the, the one which, well, according which we were expanding our Lagrangian density. And for example, one can check that at higher order, the, the correction uh, is um, get more complicated and you find uh, once you perform the same analysis as before, this modified a uh, rich equation, a uh, rich flow equation where you get this additional term, and this is what is known as the RG2 flow equation. Another interesting um, line would be to, to consider the nonlinear sigma model with a manifold with boundary, in which, in this case, the, the flow associated with this equation would be the, uh, the Ricci flow as well as the mean curvature flow, this would arise from um, a suitable boundary term, which, uh, which has to be added to the, to the Lagrangian density in this case. Okay, I think uh, I've, I'm done with that and therefore I thank you for your attention. Uh, are there questions from the audience? From. Yeah, uh, sorry, the, the, just to understand this last question. So this is uh, in the context of string theory. This is the what's known as the alpha prime corrections, right? To the to the Einstein's equations. So so this this never stops, right? This series in powers of new continues yes, indeed. with you can, higher and higher priori, curvature. You can invariant. go to higher order in the expansion, and this would uh, um, get further and further correction. There are some claims actually that, however, if you somehow control this flow, so the Ricci flow plus this RG2 flow, you should somehow be able to, to control also the all other terms. But um, so far, I, I don't know any, any proof of this actually, uh, possibly because it's also quite difficult to compute the higher order correction to this uh, flow. Okay, so if there are no more questions, so we can thank the speaker again. And we move to our next speaker, who should be on site.
So our next speaker is Miguel Ballesteros, the Universidad Nacional Autonoma de México, and we'll talk about resonances and scattering theory in the spin boson uh, model. Okay. Um, maybe this is work, right? Also work, yes. uh, maybe this okay. Uh, you're good. Uh, okay. So how do Uh, it's okay, so I'll do it with this. Okay. Yeah, thanks. And the uh, pointer? Yeah. Um, so I would like to thank uh, the organizers uh, for allowing me to present my work here. And also I would like to thank uh, all, all the people that are still here. It's, it's too late. And I'm sure that everyone is very tired. And thank you very much for remaining in the, in, in the room. Um, so this is a joint work with uh, Dirk Deckert, uh, Jeremy Faupin, and uh, Felix Henle. Uh, um, a very important question in, in, in the context of resonances is uh, the relation of the resonances with the scattering processes. And this question was uh, solved uh, in, the, in quantum mechanics in 1973. Uh, by Barry Simon, and this was a concluding paper um, from a long uh, series of papers uh, that justified the definition of resonances, because resonances are understood in terms of bumps of the scattering matrix. This, uh, this result uh, relates uh, the green function of the, of, of, of the Hamiltonian with the, the scattering uh, matrix. And this is, uh, it's given by, by, I don't know how to, how to do the pointer. It's, it's given by, by well, this equation. Uh, he write uh, the matrix element of the, of the scattering uh, operator in terms of uh, this function G, and G is the given function of, of, of the system. So this was an, an important uh, result uh, published in the Annals of Mathematics. And uh, the question for quantum field theory remain open. So the goal of our uh, yeah yeah thanks mm -hmm. it's not working the the what. I have to look at this. Oh, thanks. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks. So the goal of, of, of our program is is to is is twofold. It's first, is a mathematical uh, objective is to prove uh, this uh, the formula uh, for for models in quant in quantum field theory. And uh, this has a physical content because this kind of formulas is, is very natural in the con in quantum field theory because it, will, it, it expresses the uh, photons that are emitted by atoms in the in, in scattering experiments. And this is what has, was uh, originally viewed in, 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 the, in, the, in the foundation of quantum mechanics. So this is uh, the kind of uh, um, uh, Patterns that we want to, to prove uh, in, in the model that we study is, for example, the Valmer series of the hydrogen atom, in which you have the, the spectral lines, and these spectral lines are photons, and then uh, so that, that they had to be written in terms of scattering of the scattering matrix. And uh, up to now, in, in the rigorous mathematical framework, they were, they were uh, described in terms of, 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 of poles of the, of the green function. So we want to, to take them as a bomb. I mean, we want to study them and, and to prove that they, they are bombs in, 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 the, in the scattering uh, cross section uh, for bosons that are, that are scattered uh, by atoms. So this is what we want to prove. And uh, so this is the model that we use. Is, 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 uh, we, we restrict ourselves for simplicity to the spin boson model in which we have only a two-level atom 
uh, coupled to a quantized quantize, uh, boson field. So we uh, the know by H C two this is uh, will be the 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 Hilbert space of of the of the atom, and uh, the bosonic Fox space is, is is just given by F of H, and and is given by the formula that you can see in 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 the screen. So this is this is the simple model that we have, but it all already uh, uh, has all the features that we need to describe this, the, the experiments or the experiences that we that I that I def that I uh, mentioned at the beginning. So the the Hamiltonian of the of the atom uh, is is given here only by a matrix, a two by two matrix, and there is a ground state that we know by E naught, and an excited state that we know by E one. The 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 free uh, Hamiltonian of, of the photons is given by the formula three, in which the photon, uh, the energy of of a boson, is uh, is just the the norm of of, of k, or if it is massive, uh, the k squared plus m squared to the one half. So we're well allowed two situations: the massive situation and the non-massive situation. And this is uh, something. Maybe strange that was uh, for us a little bit surprising. The massive situation is also complicated. It has uh, different complications. It's not simpler. Uh, it's, it has some bad parts also. I mean, it's, they're more or less equally difficult. But the, the, the mass does not. Uh, I mean, it creates problems. The mass. Uh, we have a, a, a we, we have an interaction energy that we know by B. And it's given in, in, in the slide, in the last, last formula of the slide. And uh, so we will uh, study the, the Hamiltonian, that, that is the, the sum, I mean, I mean, the free Hamiltonian will be the sum of the free uh, uh, photon Hamilton, uh, uh, atom Hamiltonian plus the free boson Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian that we study, interacting Hamiltonian, is the free Hamiltonian plus a potential times a coupling constant that we uh, suppose that is, uh, that is very small. It's strange, it's, uh, it's, it's, it doesn't actualize here. I mean, okay. So we consider an analytic continuation of the, of the Hamiltonians and, and we just uh, uh, construct the family, analytic family that are, that, that are labeled by a superscript theta in the complex numbers, and this, this is an analytic family of Hamiltonians, and they are uh, constructed via dilations. That means that we just rescale the, the momentum <coughs> of the photon, and uh, by, by a factor of e to the minus theta, this only for theta real, and then, and then this produces a, uh, an expression for the Hamiltonians only for theta real, and then we extend it analytically for theta complex. So this is what we do. I do not show the details of that. Uh, then, um, so the first theorem uh, that I consider is, is the, the construction of ground, ground state energy and the resonance, so this is something that is carried out via the multiscale analysis. Uh, so we prove the existence of, of ground state energy, the lambda naught, and resonance, uh, and resonance lambda one, with the corresponding projections uh, P naught and P and P one, and the ground, uh, ground state uh, that is not normalized, we don't, we don't use the normalized states. It's uh, given by phi, uh, psi uh, lambda naught, this is the ground state, and the excited state is five lambda one. Um, now, in, uh, for scattering uh, theory, we uh, we use the, the asymptotic creation and annihilation operators uh, that are given in the formula in the first formula of the slide. Uh, the proof that they exist is 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 more, is more or less standard. It's is 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 done by by several people like like Benjamin Schleim or, or of um, the Reshinsky, uh, Gerard, the, this, uh, the Grissimer, they, they, they studied this, uh, an asymptotic complete of that. Uh, so the asymptotic Hilbert space are defined as, as, as the be asymptotic vacuum, tensor pro with the uh, photon uh, boson uh, space, and the asymptotic vacuum is, uh, is a set of uh, vectors in the, 
in, in the Hilbert space that are annihilated by all the, the asymptotic annihilation operators. So for simplicity, we will restrict ourselves to the, to the leading order term of the scattering processes, which is uh, the, the, uh, when there is one incoming uh, photon and one outgoing photon. So this is uh, what we're going to study. Now this is for simplicity, we can also deal with more general cases. So in this case, uh, we define the, the scattering ma matrix with an, in, an uh, uh, incoming uh, uh, boson with wave function L and, out, and an outgoing boson with wave function H uh, by the formula that we have in the slide, S of H and L. And then uh, what is important to us is that the, the transition matrix, which is uh, also the, 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 the matrix that is usually studied in, in the concept of physics. Is the, dif is the difference of the scattering matrix minus the identity. And this is what, what, uh, what measures the sc scattered uh, bosons. And um, so this is uh, the first uh, theorem is that, uh, is one of the main results is that uh, uh, we can express the uh, transition matrix in terms of a principal order, uh, uh, which we call TP, plus a remainder. The remainder can be controlled in terms of the coupling constant. And uh, the principal term is, is, is given by this split formula that can be written in terms of the resonance and the ground state energies. I mean, this is exactly what, what is seen in experiments. If we, if we make a graph of the formula five, we'll find something like this. So this is a bump. On the scattering uh, in the scattering cross section, uh, um, at the position uh, when when the momentum of the of the of the, of the uh, on the boson is equal, the difference of the excited uh, energy, I mean considering lamp shift, minus the uh, the the ground state. So, and if you can uh, you can see this, that there is uh, I mean this wide there is uh, the wide of this bump is given by the imaginary power of lambda one. This is uh, what we can see on the experiments. So we can see the spectral lines and these spectral lines are a bit wide. And this wideness is given by the imaginary power of lambda one. The, this is the, the resonance. So the, uh, we have another formula which is exact. And this is exactly the formula the, that Barry Simon gave at the beginning in which we express the transition matrix in terms of a uh, of an integral kernel operator, and this integral kernel operator is given by the green function of the problem. So this is uh, this is the analogous formula for in a quantum, a quantum, quantum field theory of uh, the formula that I showed at the beginning uh, that was uh, um, proved in the '73 for for the case of quantum mechanics. This is analogous for quantum field theory. Um, so the, the bibliography, there are many people that contribute in, on, on this area. I mean, for resonances, the famous papers of Bach, Frolik, Siegel, and also uh, the spectral analysis of Hübner and Spohn, and Alessandro Piso for the multiscale analysis. There are important contributions uh, for many people in the community. And, uh, and uh, scattering uh, theory was also uh, studied uh, separately by the Sinski, Gerard, Freulich, Kresimischlein, and Fopin, uh, Siegel, um, and um, Bonny. Um, I don't know how much time do I ha It's about to finish, right? My time? Let me check. I didn't check. So, eh? a couple of minutes. I can stop here, yeah. I mean, this is, this is the main reason. I mean, this is, yeah. So, I. Just uh, thank you, every, every, everybody. So, uh, what do, do you expect that there are general features of your quantum field theory for the formula to be true? I mean, you checked it in a specific case, but maybe it's enough that something is true to, for the formula 
to be correct? Or? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, I think that it, it will be true, it will be correct for, for Pauli Fields model also, and, and also more, I mean, uh, but uh, it's ha and also for for other uh, scattering processes. I mean, it it should be correct. Uh, uh, but uh, we managed to prove the formula, exact formula, only for the non-massive case. So the massive cases is is, is we only get this uh, first order term. And uh, for the case of polyfields, it's very complicated because then uh, you have. Uh, you have the Laplacian, and, and I mean, the, I mean, the, the whole method is based on a contour deformation and to the complex plane, and using the Laplace transform to estimate, estimate time evolution and estimating a lot of oscillatory integrals. It's it's a it's a it's a complicated result. It's a, it's a, I think there are, I mean there are like three or four papers on that I described just now, and uh, they are long. And so, but uh, in the case of quantum uh, quantum field theory. For, for the polyphase model, we have a big problem, and it's the fact that the Laplacian uh, gives this absolutely continuous spectrum, and we cannot deform the contour uh, to the to lower part of a complex plane, and it's also a, a big problem to get uh, to the real line. I mean, this is kind of a limiting assortion principle. We use that, or more theory also is used um, uh, to get uh, to to get to the real. Uh, um, I mean to get values of the resolvents in the real in the real axis uh, where it's normally ill defined. This is very complicated, and for the case of polyphase model, it could be that it's uh, it's it's it's, uh, it's 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 very complicated. But we expect that that is correct. So we're working on that also. But uh, it I think is is true. As you s I mean the answer is yes. I think it's true in more in our models, uh, but it's difficult to prove. Yeah. Thanks. Next speaker should also be on site. Yes. So our next speaker is Jonathan van Dimok from SUNY at Buffalo, and we'll talk about ultraviolet stability for quantum electrodynamics in the equal three. Thanks. And clicker. Oh, oh, there it yeah. is. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you, Paul, for staying to the bitter end here. So, um, I want to talk about um, quantum and electrodynamics in three dimensions. Uh, this is a Euclidean quantum field theory for uh, relativistic electrons and photons in a finite volume and initially uh, with some uh, ultraviolet regularization as well. And uh, the ultraviolet regularization is going to be uh, uh, created by putting things on a lattice, and so we have a, and the infinite volume part is going to be a torus. So we have a three dimensional toroidal lattice with spacing L to minus N. L here is just some fixed positive number. <clears throat> so the, the action uh, for such a theory I've written here, it depends on. Uh, the charge E, uh, a gauge field A, abelian gauge field A, and a Fermi field uh, psi. And it's a sum of uh, a free uh, gauge action, uh, a Fermi action, which I've written here, and some counter terms. And in more detail, uh, A is um, defined on bonds in the lattice, that is, nearest neighbor pairs. Uh, DA is a field strength, um, so the electromagnetic field, uh, which is defined on plaquettes in the lattice, that is squares. And uh, psi bar and psi are Fermi fields. They're 
generators of a Grassmann algebra. And this, this DAE is a covariant direct operator uh, which couples to the gauge field with this charge E. And I'm adding to that a uh, background mass M, M bar. <clears throat> uh, and then there's counterterms, mass counterterm and energy density counterterm, um, which um, are going to depend on the lattice spacing. That, that EN there should be multiplied by the volume, but actually I'm thinking about a unit volume, so it doesn't have to be there. And the kind of object we're interested in is a, a partition function, which is the integral of uh, e to the minus action um, over all the fields, and also correlation functions, which would be uh, the moments of this measure here. And the, the overall problem is to let the lattice spacing go to zero and uh, to take the infinite volume limit. Now, this is sort of a basic model, uh, except uh, that it's in three dimensions rather than the physical four dimensions. Uh, but nevertheless, essentially nothing is known about this model until now. And I, now I have a result to report which is ultraviolet stability. So assume the, the background mass is positive and the charge is sufficiently small, then the statement is that you can choose the counter terms in such a way that the relative partition function, which is the interacting partition function divided by the free partition function, is bounded above and below uh, uniformly in the lattice cut, cut off, uh, in the lattice spacing, rather. So this is uh, the first step in the construction of, of a model, in, at least in finite volume. The, the methods that go into the proof of this theorem <coughs> uh, should also work for uh, showing that the correlation functions have a uniform bound and that the correlation functions have a continuum limit. Taking the infinite volume limit is, is another question, which lies in the future. So th the proof of this uh, theorem is, uses the renormalization group method that's uh, due to Balaban. And uh, this proof uh, builds on earlier work on related models, not on this model, by Balaban, by Imbri, Jaffe, O'Carroll, and Shore. So I, I can't really uh, outline the, the proof, but I can just mention some, uh, some features of the proof. The most characteristic feature is block averaging. So in, in a single step of the renormalization group method, uh, you integrate over all fields which have a fixed average on L blocks. And that will give you an effective action on a coarser lattice. And it eliminates some of the degrees of freedom. It reduces the number of variables. And you repeat that over and over again, and eventually you, you uh, get rid of all but a finite number of variables, and then you can do the integral. Right? The whole problem is you have an unbounded number of variables here. So th the issue is then to, to uh, keep track of these effective actions. You have to control these effective actions to control the theory. Another feature is that the, the integral as I wrote it uh, doesn't actually converge, you need gauge fixing. And in this, in this method, you impose an axial gauge fixing at each, at each of these uh, block averaging steps. And you impose it in the axial gauge, which means you, but it's not the usual axial gauge. This axial gauge means setting the, the gauge field equal to zero 
on trees, maximal trees in each L block. The axial gauge is, is preferred because, uh, because that's the one for which stability is most obvious. That is, that's the one where the integrals are going to converge. But uh, there, then there's a, a, a new gauge field for, uh, that's defined on the, on the uh, centers of these blocks. And that is not gauge fixed in this step. step. And you preserve gauge invariance in these, in these new block fields. So it's sort of a, a partial gauge fixing, and you leave some gauge invariance uh, as well. Another feature is that at each step, you specify large and small field regions, which uh, you, you sp these are in regions which are um, um, unions of blocks. Um, and uh, in the small field regions, all the fields are small. All the gauge fields are small. That is, all the field strengths are small. This is a characteristic. This is defined in terms of dA. And in the large field regions, uh, at, at least some dA is big in each block. And then you sum over all possibilities for, for this for this assignment of large and small field regions. The idea is that the large field regions are, are not going to contribute much because you have a factor of e to the minus dA squared that you're integrating over. And uh, that's going to be enough to, to give a tiny contribution and give you the convergence of this sum. So, the main contribution is from the small field region. And at each step in the small field region, you would identify a new action by expanding around the critical points of the old action as constrained by this, this uh, block averaging. And these new critical fields are then linear functions of the basic fundamental fields. Now, for, it turns out that it's easiest to express the effective actions in terms of um, these critical fields. But the expression, which looks sort of like what you started with, you have to take derivatives of them. And so these have to be uh, somewhat smooth. And um, that's not going to be true if we stick in the, in the axial gauge. These critical fields are initially defined in the axial gauge, but it's, it's crucial to switch gauges here and switch to a covariant gauge like a Landau gauge uh, in order to get the smoothness uh, that you want so that these things can sit in the action. Another point is that these critical fields um, have a multi-scale structure due to the fact that you're, you're averaging uh, on various scales in various regions, and uh, it's a somewhat complicated structure. And in order to understand the structure of these critical fields, uh, you have to do something. And what turns out to work is a multi-scale random walk expansion. That is probably the most technical part of the proof, is getting these multi-scale random walk expansions. But once you have those, you have some control over these critical fields. And uh, you can express the, uh, the action in terms of them. Now, before I say what it is, it's, it, it turns out to be convenient to scale up to a, a large unit lattice at the start. As we started on this very fine lattice, but scale it up to a, a large unit lattice. And that scales down all the coupling constants and masses by an exponential factor. And they all become very tiny. So then at each step, after you do the block averaging, you scale back to, to a unit lattice. So most of the calculations are done on this unit lattice, except that these critical fields 
uh, in this scenario live on finer and finer lattices, eventually getting back to your original fine lattice. So when you express the, uh, the action after k steps, you get something like what I've written here. It's, it's a, uh, a uh, field strength of this critical field, a k squared. And then there's something that's like the Dirac operator you started with, but, but not exactly. This is denoted by this script s here. It's quadratic in the Fermi fields, just like, the, just like what we started with. Um, and it, it depends on these critical fields and on a scaled uh, coupling constant, EK. And then there's these counter terms, which uh, have changed as we go through the steps. So I'm, I'm, MK is the counter term after K steps. Epsilon K is the, the density after K steps. And then everything that doesn't fit into this uh, framework is given by a, a, a sum of polymer functions. A polymer here is a connected union of, of very large blocks, m blocks, which are some power of l. And uh, you're summing over these uh, polymer functions, ekx. And these have the property that ekx only depends on fields in x. And furthermore, that it decays exponentially in the number of blocks in X. So this gives a, a sort of complete localization to this, um, this action after K steps. And this is critical in keeping control over the action. That you, you have to keep things localized. Uh, you also have to keep things gauge invariant. Everything I've written there is gauge invariant. And you also have to uh, keep things invariant under lattice symmetries, which is possible to do. So just to finish the story then, the, the way that these actions evolved are given by the following equations. As you move from step k to step k plus 1, the, um, the coupling constant scales up by L to 1 half. Remember, these things are all stopping, starting very tiny, and they're all growing as, uh, as we iterate. If we, were, if we were keeping track of coupling constant renormalization, then uh, there'd be some corrections to that. But in three dimensions, we don't have to do that because it's a super renormalizable model. But for the mass and the energy density, we do. The, the mass is scaling up by L and times the mass in the previous step. And then there's corrections to the mass that you extract out of the action in the previous step. And uh, so you have to add that to the old mass and then scale up. And the same with the energy density. The energy density scales up by L cubed and there's corrections and there's it's epsilon star of EK, and there should be an MK there, too, and an, an EK. And then the polymer function uh, functions uh, depend on everything in the, in the previous step. But when you make the corrections to the mass and the energy, you take out the relevant parts of, of the previous step. And that means the, these polymer functions are not going to grow. You've taken out the relevant part. The only thing that's growing is uh, these, the mass and the uh, energy density, well, and the coupling constant. But you've isolated the, the, the growth. And that's the important thing. You, you, um, the danger is that, um, that this uh, set of fields will, will blow up. Right? And you, you want to uh, keep, it, keep it bounded nicely. In fact, you want to keep it small. These equations only hold as long as things stay small. 
So the, the, the theorem, which I quoted, basically says that uh, you can choose the initial conditions so that they continue to, to stay small. In fact, more than that, it says you can choose the final values of the mass and the energy density to be any small value you want, and then you can, you can choose the initial conditions, that is the counter terms, to attain that, um, that value when you're finished. So this is renormalization. This, is, this choice of counter terms is renormalization. Renormalization has become a, uh, a problem in finite, in uh, discrete dynamical systems, albeit uh, with an unbounded number of variables. So w once you keep control over that flow, that, it, that immediately gives you the stability and hence the result. Thank you. So uh, you, you say that you keep, um, in this expansion, you write all gauge invariant terms. So this means that you keep uh, e to the i a psi bar psi as it is. Uh, uh, so the fermionic propagator at each scale depends on a. You don't uh, expand e to the i a in, in any way to eliminate. Uh, I, I don't know if, uh, if I was. Uh, um. So perturbatively, you would, uh, I don't know, expand e to the i a, you would keep uh, psi bar psi on a, on a side and, and write the fermionic propagator as a. Well, you, that's right. You, you don't expand it in the, in the current fields, but in the next step, you're gonna, it's going to be a, back, a, a, a block field plus a fluctuation. And in the fluctuation, you expand it out. But you don't have to keep track of gauge invariance in that fluctuation field because you're integrating it out. Okay, so, so you say the propagator on each scale uh, has a e to the i a, which is just a background uh, thing, or? Well, it's well hidden, yeah, but yes, yeah. So, I mean, do you have an explicit form of the propagator on each scale, or? Uh, do you just have... Uh, you, you have Green's functions. I, I guess that's what you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, they explicitly involve E to the IA, yeah. Okay, so and thanks to this gauge invariance, uh, you, you, um, you don't need to add the counter terms like uh, A squared or A cubed. Uh, that perturbatively would be there. That, right, that's exactly why it's important to maintain the gauge invariance, because otherwise, you, as you iterated this thing, you, corrections to the mass would, would occur, right? right? The gauge invariance is suppressing all those. That's critical. Right. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. I, I have a question more, more pragmatic, so if you, so can you actually use this method to compute observables to, to actually, I mean, correlation functions, for example, and, or, or you just get these proofs of uh, existence? Well, compute in what sense? <laughs> I mean, I, the, the next step would be to, uh, my question is how explicit this is. It's just a proof of you just put bounds, but you don't have these functions explicitly, or can you actually compute these functions and use it to compute, I don't know, observables like correlation function, well, the two-point function? The, the next step would be to, uh, t to put in some, uh, some external fields in the action and then prove it with the, some localized external fields. Um, to have a generating function. Yeah, so you would have a generating function and then prove it's analytic in the generating function and then derivatives of that would give you correlation functions. That all seems quite doable. Yeah, the, the, the same proof should probably work. Yes, yes. So quick, sorry. But why do you need the, uh, the fermionic mass to be positive if you are in finite volume? I, I think you, you said that M bar was positive. Yeah, that, um, 
M bar did, the only time M bar had to be pos, strictly positive was at the very last step when I've reduced things down to just a finite number of variables. Because of the fact that I took um, a, a torus rather than say a square with uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions, I needed to have M positive to, to get that last um, oh, okay. thing to, to converge. But it, it, it's not serious. Okay. I mean, I could, if I'd used the square with Dirichlet boundary conditions, um, I could have had M bar equal to zero. Um, just a clarification about the um, block averaging. Uh, so you said you use uh, Balaban's method. I'm not very acquainted to it. Uh, so I was wondering, have you got a non-local kernel when you do the this averaging? Or I mean, I'm thinking of the the method by Gavetz and Kupian, and uh, in that case, they they have such a non-local kernel. And for instance, if I look at the at this expression now, um, they wouldn't use the block fields. So can you just briefly comment on that? I'm more or less constrained. First of all. When I average, do the block averaging on the fermions, um, I have to build into it those factors e to the ia in a, to keep it covariant. That is, the block average has to be covariant when, the, when you make gauge transformations. And if, if you're not block averaging, if you're, I don't know, uh, introducing cutoffs in momentum space or something, then you're lost because you can't preserve the gauge invariance with each step like that. Also, that's why we're on the lattice in the first place. If you do any other kind of regularization, you have a very hard time preserving gauge invariance. But, sorry, um, but when you kind of split the field into the block average and the fluctuation, it's just as it is, or you, you, you do have a no local kernel? Um, kernel between what? Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm really thinking of the methods by Gavatsky and Kupian, and so maybe it's just totally different. It's just that whenever they do this block averaging, there is no, uh, you cannot just write the field as a block averaging field plus fluctuation, you kind of have a further kernel, and that's, I don't know, it's, it's kind of complicated, so this is why I was wondering. Well, the, 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 the block average field gets smeared out. Yeah, it, yeah, precisely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's, right, that's what I was talking about when I called these things critical fields. Those, those critical fields are defined in terms of the fundamental fields by a smearing function, which is essentially the Green's function. Yeah, yeah so I, I think it's the same as, more or less, as Gowetsky Kupiana. Okay. Uh, we we'll move on to the last talk, which uh, is online. Okay, so <laughs> okay, so last talk is by Gerardo Morsella from Torvegato University of Rome, and it's about ultraviolet and infrared finiteness of quantum space time through perturbative algebraic quantum field theory. Thanks. Okay. Well, thanks for the opportunity of presenting the, this work here, and thanks to, to everybody who could resist up to now. Uh, I'm going to, to talk about uh, a joint work with uh, Sergio Dobliger and, and Nicola Pinamonti, uh, which is, uh, it, it has been published in, this, in, these two, uh, in, in, in these two papers here. Um, so that, that, that could, you, could you see my slide? No. Yes, yes, we can. Ah, so, uh, okay. 
Um, we still uh, see uh, the, the first slide. Is it the first? Uh, they are not changing. No, it's not changing. Oh, sorry. M maybe I have to, to, to do something, sorry. Let me. Do, do they change now? Yes. Okay. okay. Thanks. Sorry. So th th this is the, the, the outline of the talk. I, I will first uh, recall the, the, the definition of, of quantum space time and quantum field theory uh, on quantum space time. And then I will, uh, I will discuss how perturbative algebraic quantum field theory can be, can be used to, 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 to study quantum field theory and quantum space time. And then there will be some, some conclusion and, and outlook. So quantum space time was introduced by Dobliger, Fedenagel, and Roberts in, in 95. They, they started from the observation that uh, quantum mechanics, uh, the principles of quantum mechanics and general relativity imply that uh, if you try to, 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 to localize the quantum state, uh, then, then you, you, you expect that the trapped surface forms around the localization region. And then in order to, to have, uh, in order that this localization has, a, has an operational meaning, you, you, you must require that this, this doesn't happen, so that the, the trapped surface doesn't prevent you from, from receiving signals from, from the localization region. And this leads to, to certain uh, uncertainty relations between the, the coordinates Q mu of the, of, the, of the event that you are you're looking at of the, the localization, localization region of the state. And this uncertainty relation involves the, the Planck length. This uncertainty relation, in turn, can be implemented by a sister algebra, non commutative sister algebra, which turns out to be uh, a, a trivial bundle of, of compact operators on, on, a, on a certain, certain four-dimensional manifold. And, and this, is the, the, this is the sister algebra of quantum, the so-called sister algebra of quantum space-time, which is equipped with the action with an action of the of the Poincaré group. So, in, from this point of view, this 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 uh, this, this uh, non commuted space time is, is Poincaré is Poincaré covariant. And so, in in the in the spirit of non commuted geometry, one 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 is is led to think that one should, in, in order to to keep into account at least some of the some of the effect of quantum of quantum gravity, one should. Substitute Minkowski spacetime, commuted Minkowski, Minkowski spacetime with this quantum spacetime described by this sister algebra. And then one can, can try to, to define quantum field theory on, on quantum spacetime. The first step is, of course, to define a free scalar quantum field, and this can be done in this, in this very simple way. So here, phi, phi check is just the, 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 uh, the Fourier anti transform of the usual, usual quantum, uh, quantum scalar field. And e, e to the i k q is the uh, is the exponential of the of the coordinates q mu, which generate the, the sister algebra of quantum space time. So the, this object phi q lives uh, formally in the tensor product of the usual free field algebra with the algebra of quantum space time. And this free field is non-local at small distances, so distances which are small, which are comp comparable with, with, the, with the Planck length, but locality is recovered as under Planck goes to, goes to zero. So at, at distances large with, with respect to the Planck length. Then one would like to, to, to study perturbative, uh, at least perturbatively interacting fields on quantum space time. There are several ways to introduce uh, to introduce uh, an interaction, uh, interacting fields on quantum space time. All, all these ways are actually equivalent on a, on a commutative space time, but they unfortunately become non equivalent 
on a, on a non commutative space time. So there are several possibilities. In this talk, I will focus on the on the so-called Hamiltonian approach and, and quantum weak product interaction. So the the the, the point is that the Hamiltonian approach means that we 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 define the interaction by defining an interaction Hamiltonian, which is given by by this formula, this this integral on on, on quantum space time or at fixed time is is uh, actually um, a conditional expectation in uh, a conditional expectation on the algebra of quantum space time, which can which generalizes the the, the commutative in three dimensional integral. And this, this, this object here is the so-called quantum weak product, which is a, a non-commutative generalization of the limit of coinciding points. So you, you take different points Q1 to, Q, to Qn and then take the limit Qj to, to Q to, a, to, a, to a, the same Q in this, in this product of uh, quantum fields, uh, weak order. Uh, of, of you in in, in computer space time you can you can do this in, in non computer space time this this limit has to be to be taken in a way which is compatible with non commutativity which prevents you to from taking q one equal to q two equal to q n but this can so there's a way of generalizing this and one gets this this uh, this interaction of its own and then one can define DS matrix by, by the Dyson series, and one finds that this S matrix is equivalent to, to the S matrix of a non local quantum field theory on ordinary commutative space time. And this, this, uh, this S matrix is, 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 is induced by this, uh, this complicated interaction Hamiltonian, uh, which the formula is not, is not important. What, what is important is that is there is this, this uh, Gaussian, uh, Gaussian non locality. And here, the, 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 the coupling constant, which was a constant uh, G here, has been turned into a smooth uh, compatibility supported function in order to, to introduce an, 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 an infrared cathode. Then one can study this, this, uh, this S matrix. And in this paper, uh, Dorote Abanz, Dobliger, Tedenagen, and Grad Piacitelli have shown that this S matrix is, is term by term unitary and free of ultraviolet divergences. So there are, there are no. Uh, is finite order by order, but unfortunately, the, the adiabatic limit in which this uh, this uh, cutoff function goes to to one is is it was difficult to control. Even if uh, quite recently, uh, Alexei Bigov, who, who was PhD student in Vergata, uh, could do this limit for uh, at least for green functions. So uh, anyway, in in, in the, the problem of, of controlling the adiabatic limit was, was uh, is, is still uh, is still a bit open. And from this point of view, uh, perturbative algebraic quantum field theory, which was uh, already already discussed a bit by um, Claudio da Piaggi and Nicola Drago, uh, could be useful um, because in perturbative algebraic quantum field theory. There, there is a systematic way of, of discussing the perturbative extension and also of, of controlling the, the adiabatic limit. So the main goal of this work was to uh, try to adapt perturbative algebraic quantum field theory to, to quantum space time in order to, to study the perturbative expansion and in particular the, the adiabatic limit in quantum space time. So, uh, sorry. So uh, just uh, I will I will uh, remind the, the setting of the perturbative algebra quantum field theory. Um, so the starting point is the observation that the free the free scalar the free scalar field algebra is isomorphic to an algebra f, which which is made of suitable functionals f uh, capital F of of field configurations. Uh, where suitable means that they have to satisfy some certain uh, certain way from set conditions which generalize the the, the condition the, 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 the properties of uh, the causal propagator in, in in quantum field theory and in this this this, uh, this set of functions is endowed with a product with this star product 
which is a deformation of the of the point wise product. Here in this formula, m is the point wise product, and th this point wise product is deformed by this by this exponential of this uh, functional differential operator, where delta plus is the the free two point function. Then one can uh, introduce the state omega, the free vacuum state omega naught, which is simply evaluation of a function at zero. And together with this uh, star product, one can also introduce uh, the, the time order product. And the time order product is first introduced for, for local functions with, with these joint supports by a formula similar to, to the previous one, but where the, the Feynman propagator appears instead of the, two point, the free to point function. And so, the, and, and in this way, this product is, is the time order product with respect to this, to this product, meaning that if uh, the support of F and G are in the, are, are in the right, uh, right order, then this, this product reduces to this one or to the, to the, to the one in which F and G have been interchanged. And then, and then this 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 uh, this um, key product is is extended to all local functions, not only to those with the joint support, maintaining this property of causal factorization, which is the, which is the property which I just said about the fact that uh, uh, this reduces to the star product. And this is the, the procedure of renormalization by the, the in the in the framework of Einstein and Glass. Using the, the time order product, one can then define the, the S matrix we, with an infrared cutoff, which is this G here. So one takes a functional, a functional F, which, which, which uh, represents the interaction, and, and one can define the, 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 the time order exponential of this, of this interaction. And this satisfies this, properties, this property of causal factorization. Uh, which is this property here, in which one has three functional f, g, and h, and the support of f is in is not does not intersect the path of the support of h. So, but if one wants to apply this this machinery to to perturbative to to quantum space time, the, there appears a problem because, uh, as I said, in in, in quantum space time. The, the effective interaction on community space time is non local, and this implies that this S matrix is not unitary, and which, which, which is something that which has been uh, was, was noted uh, long ago by, by Fink. Um, so, in order to, to avoid, avoid this problem, the key observation is that this, this, uh, no, this non local interaction in the adiabatic limit is equivalent to another non-local interaction, which has this form, in which there appears the convolution of the field with this, with this, Gaussian, with this Gaussian kernel to, to, to the n power. So this suggests the following. This suggests that if we, we can make another deformation of the product of the algebra by pulling back by pulling back the, this, this action of, of uh, convolution with the Gaussian, the ERG lambda is the Gaussian as it was in the previous slide, to, to, to the functionals. If, if, so if we define the, this pullback R lambda, this has the property that it maps this local interaction to the non-local interaction which we had in the previous slide. And it transforms the previous star product in a new star lambda product, which is defined by a formula which is analogous to the previous one, but where now there appears not, not, uh, not the, 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 the usual two-point function, but this twisted, this deformed two-point function, delta plus lambda, which is defined by, by this tribal convolution of the ordinary two-point function, which uh, the Gaussian on the left and on the right. And this has the property of being smooth and bounded. So then one can repeat uh, the, the, the definition of the time order at product with respect to this, to this uh, star lambda product. And this new, new time order at product, contrary to the commutative case, is directly well defined on a certain subalgebra A of the algebra, uh, of the algebra S of function. This is the algebra in which there appear no, no field derivatives. 
So, and this is directly well defined without without the need of, of the process of renormalization, Be simply because this this uh, this modified Feynman propagator is is bounded. It's a continuous Feynman bound function. So one gets. Uh, the, 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 this result that if one takes uh, as, as VG this interaction and one then defines the, the S metric with this, with this new uh, time order T lambda, T lambda product, the, the S metric is again ordered by order finite, is unitary, and it, uh, it again enjoys a, a remnant of the causal, of the causal factorization property, property, which we call a temporal factorization property, where now the factorization happens when. A, a and B, A, a and C, sorry, uh, the supports of A and C is such that the support of A is later than the support of C in the Lorentz frame, which is fixed by the star lambda product. Uh, I should have mentioned that this star lambda product breaks Lorentz invariance because, uh, because, uh, because in this in this Gaussian there appears the Euclidean the Euclidean node of y minus x. So it, 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 it fixes a, a Lorentz frame. Anyway, in, in, in this Lorentz frame, the, the, the rules this, this temporal factorization property, and this, this temporal factorization property is as, as a nice as a nice consequence. If one defines interacting fields by the so-called Bogoliubov map, which is given by this, this formula. Um, the temporal factorization implies that this this interacting field only depends on the restriction of the of the cutoff function g to the past of the support of a. So you can change the 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 the, 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 cut, the cutoff function g in, in the in the future of the support of a without affecting this this interacting field. So that in particular one can assume that g is a product of a function of time. And the function of, of, of space, and the function of time is equal to one in the future of a, of a given of a given uh, time minus epsilon, and, and the support of a is is all contained in the future of this of this uh, of this slice t equals minus epsilon. So the interacting vacuum should be obtained when when epsilon goes to goes to plus infinity. So this means that the interaction here has been switched off at t equals minus epsilon, and then we switch, to, we we shift the point at which the interaction has, has been shifted on to minus infinity. Actually, the, the direct control of this limit is difficult, but the solution sorry the solution is to approximate. Uh, the interacting vacuum by interacting KMS state with a, with a fixed spatial cutoff H, which can be defined in this, in this uh, quantum space time setting in a way completely analogous to the, the definition by Fredenagan and Lindner, which I don't have time to, to, to discuss, but I think Nicola Villamonti on Friday will, will say something about, about this, this work. And so the final result is that. Uh, Making the limit in which beta goes to, to infinity and simultaneously the, the, the spatial cutoff goes to, to the constant one, this limit exists and defines a state on, on the, uh, at first on, on this subalgebra of the algebra A, which is invariant under space time translation. And using invariance under space time translation, it, this state can be extended to, to all of. Uh, to, to the entire algebra. So to, to conclude, so the, the summary is that uh, the, the, the S matrix of a non-local quantum field theory on quantum space time can be obtained by uh, an ultraviolet finite effective non-local quantum field theory on ordinary space time. In general, the in, in, uh, in the first attempt, the adiabatic limit is, is problematic, but perturbative algebraic quantum field theory, uh, perturbative algebraic quantum field theory can be adapted to, to treat quantum field theory on quantum space time, uh, yielding again a unitary and ultraviolet finite S matrix without the need of renormalization. And the adiabatic limit uh, using this, these techniques can, can be performed on vacuum expectation values of interacting observables. 
so some some of you some of you uh, further further work would be to to study the strong adiabatic limit so the, the limit of s matrix elements and then to to extend this to to more in, more more physically interesting theories like like QED on, on quantum space time and study possible observable consequences and also it would be interesting to study some ability properties in, in four dimension of the perturbation extension that, that one gets because it seems that these properties can, can be can be can be analyzed quite easily. Thanks a lot. So are there questions? I have a basic uh, confusion. So, I, I mean, I thought the one of the main difficulties of quantum field theory is to really keep Lorentz invariance. I mean, because that's why we don't like non-local theories. If we if we drop Lorentz invariance and we're just doing non-local theories, then uh, I mean everything is easier. So I'm, I'm I'm not sure exactly what is the motivation if you if you are accepting that you break Lorentz invariance like that. Um, uh, of course, breaking our is, is, an, is an, an undesirable feature of this of, of the model. The, the, the point is that uh, it is not not just just a breaking of Lorentz invariance put in by end. It is motivated by by so by, by this this uh, description of quantum space time. Uh, so actually, the, the, the quantum space time in itself in itself. Maintains maintains Lorentz invariance as, as I said at the beginning. It, unfortunately, up to now there, there, there would there, no 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 way have been found to to introduce an interaction which preserves which preserves Lorentz invariance. It, it seems so. I, I discussed this uh, this approach, but there are other approaches to to the introduction of interaction. Any any one of these approaches at some point breaks Lorentz invariance. The point is that so one of the hopes is that this is, this is a breaking which can be controlled in, in, in some way. So it's not, not just an, an, uh, a breaking put in by end, but it has some 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 meaning which hopefully can be can be can be controlled. Okay, thank you. Thank the speaker again. And we can conclude our session. <laughs>